Hachette Audio presents Sharp Ends, stories from the world of the first law by Joe Abercrombie. Read by Stephen Pacey and featuring Joe Abercrombie. A Beautiful Bastard Kadir, Spring 566 Yes, shrieked Salem Ruse, quartermaster of his august majesty's first regiment. Give him hell! Hell was what Colonel Glockter always gave his opponents, whether in the fencing circle, on the battlefield, or in the far more savage context of a social engagement. His three hapless sparring partners lumbered after him as ineffectually as the cuckolded husbands, ignored creditors, and spurned companions did wherever he passed. Glockter smirked as he danced around them, fully living up to his twin reputations as the Union's most celebrated swordsman and show-off. He pranced and prowled, switched and swaggered, nimble as a mayfly, unpredictable as a butterfly, and, when he chose, vindictive as an offended wasp. "'Put some effort in!' he called, spinning clear of an inept lunge, then administering a smart thwack across the buttocks of its perpetrator that made the crowd convulse with mocking laughter. "'Good show!' called Lord Marshal Varouz, rocking with enjoyment in his folding field chair. "'Damn good show!' snapped Colonel Croy at his right hand. "'Excellent work!' chuckled Colonel Polder on the left, the two of them competing to agree the most with their commander. Quite as if there could be no enterprise more noble than humiliating three recruits who had scarcely held a sword before in their lives. Salem Ruse, with outward delight and secret shame, cheered as loudly as any of them, but he couldn't prevent his eyes occasionally wandering from the fascinating, nauseating exhibition. Over to the valley and the wretched example of military disorganization it contained. While its commanders sunned themselves up here on the ridge, quaffing wine, chortling away at Glockter's self indulgent display, relishing the priceless luxury of a breath of breeze, down in the sun baked crucible below, partly obscured in a choking fog of dust, the greater part of the Union army struggled on. Under quite as if there could be no enterprise more noble than humiliating three recruits who had scarcely held a sword before in their lives. Salem Ruse, with outward delight and secret shame, cheered as loudly as any of them, but he couldn't prevent his eyes occasionally wandering from the fascinating, nauseating exhibition. Over to the valley and the wretched example of military disorganization it contained. While its commanders sunned themselves up here on the ridge, quaffing wine, chortling away at Glockter's self-indulgent display, relishing the priceless luxury of a breath of breeze, down in the sun-baked crucible below, partly obscured in a choking fog of dust, the greater part of the Union army struggled on. It had taken them all day to squeeze soldiers, horses, and the steadily degrading wagons that carried their supplies over the narrow bridge, taunted by the trickle of water in the deep-cut creek below. Now the men were strung out in sluggish shreds and tatters, more sleepwalking than marching. Any hint of a road had long ago been stomped away, and all semblance of shape, discipline, or morale was a distant memory. Red jackets, polished breastplates, drooping golden standards all turned the ubiquitous beige of the sun-parched Gurkish dust. Ruse hooked a finger into his collar and tried to get a little air onto his sweaty neck, wondering again if someone should be doing more to bring order to the chaos down there. Surely it would be a damn bad thing for them if the Gurkish turned up now— and the Gurkish had a habit of turning up at the worst moments. But Ruse was only a quartermaster. Among the officers of the first, he was considered the lowest of the low, and no one bothered to try and hide the fact, not even him. He shrugged his prickling shoulders, and decided, as he so often did, 
that it was simply someone else's problem. He let his eyes be drawn back, as if by magnetic attraction to the peerless athleticism of Colonel Glockter. The man would no doubt have looked handsome in a portrait, but it was the way he stood, the way he grinned, sneered, cocked a mocking eyebrow, the way he moved, that truly set him apart. He had the poise of a dancer, the stance of a hero, the strength of a wrestler, the speed of a snake. Two summers ago, in the considerably more civilized surroundings of Adua, Ruse had watched Glockter win the contest without conceding a single touch. He had watched from the cheap seats, of course, so high above the circle that the fences were tiny in the distance, but even so, his heart had pounded and his hands twitched in time to their movements. Observing his idol at close quarters had only intensified his admiration. Honestly, it had intensified it beyond the point a reasonable judge would have called love. But it had also tempered that admiration with a bitter, spiteful, and carefully concealed hatred. Glockter had everything, and what he didn't have, no one could stop him from taking. Women adored him, men envied him. Women envied him, and men adored him, for that matter. One would have thought, with all the good fortune showered upon him, he would have to be the most pleasant man alive. But Glockter was an utter bastard. A beautiful, spiteful, masterful, horrible bastard. Simultaneously the best and worst man in the Union. He was a tower of self-centered self-obsession, an impenetrable fortress of arrogance. His ability was exceeded only by his belief in his own ability. Other people were pieces to be played with, points to be scored, props to be arranged in the glorious tableau of which he made himself the centerpiece. Glockter was a veritable tornado of bastardy, leaving a trail of flattened friendships, crushed careers, and mangled reputations in his heedless wake. His ego was so powerful it shone from him like a strange light, distorting the personalities of everyone around him at least halfway into being bastards themselves. Superiors became sniveling accomplices. Experts deferred to his ignorance. Decent men were reduced to sycophantic shits. Ladies of judgment to giggling ciphers. Ruse once heard the most committed followers of the Gurkish religion were expected to make the pilgrimage to Sarkant. In the same way, the most committed bastards might be expected to make a pilgrimage to Glockter. Bastards swarmed to him like ants to a half-eaten pastry. He had acquired a constantly shifting coterie of bastards, a backstabbing gaggle, a self-aggrandizing entourage. He had bastards streaming after him like the tail after a comet. And Ruse knew he was no better than the rest. When Glockter mocked others, he laughed along, desperate to have his pandering collaboration noticed. When, with sick inevitability, Glockter's ruthless tongue was turned on him, he laughed even louder, delighted to receive even that much attention. Teach him a lesson, he screeched as Glockter doubled one of his sparring partners up with a savage poke of the short steel in his gut. Even as he did it, Ruse wondered what lesson they were supposed to be learning, that life was cruel, horrible, and unfair, presumably. Glockter caught a man's sword scraping on his long steel, in an instant sheathed his short, and slapped him across the face, one way, then the other, pushed him bleating over with a snort of derision. The civilians who had come to observe the progress of the war spluttered their admiration while the ladies who accompanied them cooed and swished their fans in the shade of their flapping awning. Ruse stood in a paralysis of guilt and joy, only wishing he'd been the one slapped. Rose, Lieutenant West pushed in beside him and wedged one dusty boot up on the fence. West was one of the very few under Glockter's command who seemed immune to the bastardizing effect, expressing unpopular dismay at his worst excesses. Paradoxically, 
He was also one of the very few for whom Glockter appeared to have a genuine respect, in spite of his low birth. Ruse saw this, even entirely understood it, but found himself unable to follow West's example. Perhaps it was because he was fat, or perhaps he simply lacked the moral courage. He lacked every other kind of courage, after all. West, Ruse muttered from the side of his mouth, not wanting to miss a moment of the display. I've been over by the bridge. Oh, the rear guard are in a shambles. Insofar as there's a rear guard at all, Captain Lasky's laid out with that foot of his. They say he might lose it. Been wrong-footed, has he? Ruse chuckled at his own joke, congratulating himself on it being just the sort of thing Glockter might have said. His company's a mess without him. Well, I suppose that's their problem. Chap, chap. Ooh! As Glockter neatly dodged, kicked a man's foot away, and sent him rolling in the dirt. It could turn into everyone's problem pretty damn quickly, West was saying. The men are exhausted, moving slowly, and the supply train's all tangled up. Supply train's always tangled. It's practically a standing order for them. Oh! Ruse gasped with everyone else as Glockter dodged a thrust with consummate speed and kicked the man, he was hardly more than a boy, honestly, in the groin, folding him up with eyes bulging. But if the Gurkish come now, West was saying, still frowning at the parched landscape beyond the river. The Gurkish are miles away. Honestly, West, you're always worried about something. Someone needs to be. Then complain to the Lord Marshal. Ruse nodded at Veruz, who was almost tipping from his folding chair, so engrossed was he in the heady combination of swordsmanship and bullying. I've no idea what you think I can do about it. Send in an order for more horse feed? There was a sharp snapping sound as Glockter caught the last man across the face with the flat of his sword and sent him reeling back with an agonized shriek, hand to his cheek. Is that really your best? Glockter stepped forward and gave one of the others a resounding kick in the arse as he tried to get up, sending him face down in the dust to peals of merriment. Glockter soaked up the applause like some parasitic jungle flower absorbing the sap of its host, bowing, beaming, blowing kisses, and Ruse smashed his palms together until they hurt. What a bastard! Colonel Glockter was. What a beautiful bastard. As his three sparring partners hobbled from the enclosure, nursing injuries that would soon heal, and humiliations that would accompany them to the grave, Glockter draped himself across the fence behind which the ladies were gathered. He gave particular attention to Lady Wetterland, young, rich, beautiful, if considerably overpowdered, and dressed in the elaborate height of fashion, despite the heat. Recently married, but to an older husband kept in adua by the politics of the Open Council. Rumour had it he fulfilled her financial needs, but was otherwise not terribly interested in women. Colonel Glockter's interest in women, on the other hand, was infamous. Might I borrow your handkerchief? he asked. Ruse had observed a special manner he had when speaking to a woman who interested him, a slight roughening of the voice, a loitering just that fraction closer than was strictly appropriate, a tunnel-like attentiveness as though his eyes were stuck to them with glue. It hardly needed to be said that the moment he got what he wanted from his conquests, their setting themselves on fire could not persuade him to glance their way again and yet new objects of affection fell over themselves to be incinerated by the flames of scandal, with the breathless buzzing of moths around a candle, unable to resist the challenge of being the special one to buck the trend. Lady Wetterland raised one carefully plucked brow. Why ever not, Colonel? And she reached to take the handkerchief from her bodice. I... She and her attendants gasped, as quick as lightning, Glockter flicked it from her dress with the blunted point of his long steel. The gauzy fabric floated gently through the air and straight into his waiting hand with all the assurance of a magic trick.
One of the ladies gave a croaky cough, another fluttered her eyelashes. Lady Wetterland was perfectly still, eyes wide, lips parted, hand frozen halfway to her chest. Perhaps they were wondering whether the colonel could have flicked the hooks and eyes of her bodice open as easily, had he so desired. Ruse never doubted that he could have. My thanks, said Glockter, dabbing at his forehead. By all means, keep it, murmured Lady Wetterland in a voice slightly hoarse. Consider it a gift. Glockter smiled as he slipped it into his shirt, a waft of purple fabric still showing. I shall keep it close to my heart, Rose snorted, as if he had one. Glockter dropped his voice, though still perfectly audible to everyone present. And perhaps return it later? Whenever you have a moment, she whispered. And Ruse was forced to wonder once again what was so damnably attractive about things that were obviously so very, very bad for you. Glockter had already turned back to his audience, spreading his arms wide, as though to give them all a crushing, dominating, loveless hug. Is there no one among you clumsy dogs who can give our visitors a better show? Ruse felt a breathless leaping in his chest as Glockter's eyes met his. Ruse, how about you? There was a smattering of laughter, and Ruse joined in, loudest of all. Oh, I couldn't possibly, he squeaked out. I'd hate to embarrass you. He instantly realized he had gone too far. Glockter's left eye faintly twitched. I'm embarrassed whenever I find myself in a room with you. You're supposed to be a soldier, aren't you? How the hell do you stay so fat when the food is so bloody awful? More laughter, and Rue swallowed, plastering the smile to his face and feeling sweat tickle his spine beneath his uniform. Well, sir, I've always been fat, I suppose, even as a boy. His words plummeted into the sudden silence with the awful finality of victims into a mass grave. Very fat. Hugely fat. I'm a very fat man. He cleared his throat, praying that the ground would swallow him. Glockter's eyes drifted on, seeking a worthier adversary. His face brightened. Lieutenant West! he called, with a flashing flourish of his practice steel. How about you? West winced. Me? Come now, you're probably the best swordsman in the whole damn regiment. Glockter beamed even wider. The best but one, that is. West blinked about at what might easily have been several hundred expectant faces. But I have no blunted steel with me. By all means, use your battle steel. Lieutenant West looked down at the hilt of his sword. That could be rather dangerous. The edge on Colonel Glockter's smile was positively ferocious. Only if you touch me with it. More laughter, more applause, a couple of whoops from the enlisted men, a couple of gasps from the ladies. When it came to making ladies gasp, Colonel Glockter was unmatched. West! someone shouted. West! And gradually it became a chant. West! 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 The ladies laughed as they joined in, clapping in time. Go on! shouted Ruse along with the others, a kind of bullying mania upon them all. Go on! If anyone thought this was a bad idea, they kept it to themselves. Some men you simply don't argue with. Some men you'd simply like to see run through. Glockter fell into both camps. West took a long breath, then, to a smattering of applause, smoothly vaulted the fence, unbuttoned his jacket, and draped it over the rail. With the faintest ringing of metal and the faintest unhappy look, West drew his battle steel. It did not boast the jeweled quillons, gilded basketwork, or engraved ricasso that many of the splendid young officers of His Majesty's first affected. 
No man there would have called it a beautiful sword. And yet there was a beautiful economy in the way West presented it, a studied precision in his stance, an elegant control in the twitch of the wrist that brought the blade as perfectly level as the surface of a still pool, the sun glinting on a point polished to murderous sharpness. A breathless silence settled on the crowd. Commoner he might have been, but even the most ignorant observer could have told that the young Lieutenant West was no bumpkin when it came to handling a sword. You've been practicing, said Glockter, tossing his short steel to his servant, Corporal Tunney, leaving him with just the long. Lord Marshal Verus has been good enough to give me a few pointers, said West. Glockter raised a brow at his old fencing master. You never told me we were seeing other people, sir. The Lord Marshal smiled. You won a contest already, Glockter. It is the tragedy of the fencing master that he must always find new pupils to lead to victory. So nice that you're sniffing at my crown, West. But you may find I'm not quite ready to abdicate. Glockter sprang forward with lightning quickness, jabbed, jabbed. West parried, steel scraping, flickering in the sun. He gave ground, but carefully, watchfully, eyes fixed on Glockter's. Again Glockter came on, cut, cut, thrust, almost too fast for Ruse to follow, but West followed well enough, turning the slashes efficiently away, shuffling cautiously back, the crowd giving oohs and ahs with every contact. Glockter grinned. You really have been practicing. When will you learn, West, that work is no substitute for talent? And he laid into West faster and more ferociously than ever, steel ringing, clattering. He came close and dealt the young lieutenant a savage knee in the ribs, made him wince and stumble, but West found his balance instantly, parried once, twice, reeled away, and was ready once more, breathing hard. Andrews found himself wishing, with a painful longing, that West would stab Glockter right through his horrible, beautiful face and make the ladies gasp for very different reasons. Ah! Glockter sprang forward, jabbing, and West dodged the first, but to everyone's surprise came on to meet the second, steered it aside with a shrieking of steel, stepped inside Glockter's guard, and barged him heavily with his shoulder. For an instant, Glockter lurched off balance, and West growled, teeth bared, steel flashing as it darted out. Gah! Glockter reeled back, and Ruse caught a delicious flash of his face stricken with shock. Glockter's practice steel tumbled from his hand and skittered in the dirt, and Ruse found that he was bunching his fists painfully tight in delight. West started forward at once. Are you all right, sir? Glockter touched one hand to his neck, stared down at his bloody fingertips in profound puzzlement, as if he could hardly believe that he could have been caught, as if he could hardly believe that, having been caught, he might bleed like other men. Fancy that, he grunted. I'm so sorry, Colonel, stammered West, lowering his steel. For what? Glockter's twisted grin looked as if it took every grain of effort he possessed. A very fine touch. You've got a great deal better, West. And the crowd began to clap, and then to whoop, and Ruse noticed the muscles of Glockter's jaw working, and his left eye twitching, and he held out one hand and sharply snapped his fingers. Corporal Tunney, do you have my battle steel with you? The young corporal, promoted only the day before, blinked. Of course, sir. Bring it here, would you? With shocking speed, the atmosphere had turned decidedly ugly. The atmosphere around Glockter often did. Ruse looked nervously for Verus to put a stop to this deadly nonsense, but the Lord Marshal had left his seat and wandered off to stare down into the valley, Polder and Croy with him. There was to be no help from the grown-ups. With eyes on the ground, West carefully sheathed his own sword. I think I've played with knives enough for one day, sir. But you really must give me the chance to pay you back in kind. 
Honor demands it, West. Really it does. As if Glockter had the slightest idea what honor was, beyond a tool for manipulating people into doing stupid, dangerous things. Surely you understand that, nobleman or not. West's jaw tightened. Fighting one's friends with sharpened steels while there is an enemy to face seems foolish rather than honorable, sir. Are you calling me a fool? whispered Glockter, whipping his battle steel from the sheath with an angry hiss as Corporal Tunney nervously offered it out. West stubbornly folded his arms. No, sir. The crowd was struck entirely silent, but there was some sort of hubbub rising just beyond them. Ruse picked out muttered calls of, Over there! and The Bridge! but was too fixed on the drama before him to pay much attention. I advise you to defend yourself, Lieutenant West, snarled Glockter as he worked his heels into the dusty ground, baring his teeth and leveling his shining steel. And at that moment there was an ear-splitting scream guttering away into a ragged moan. She's fainted, someone called. Get her some air. Where from? I swear there isn't a breath of air in the whole bloody country, followed by braying laughter. Ruse hastened over to the civilian's enclosure on the pretext of offering assistance. He knew even less about helping people from a faint than he did about being a quartermaster, but there was always the possibility of catching a glimpse up the woman's skirts while she was insensible. It was a sad fact that Ruse was rarely, if ever, offered glimpses up the skirts of conscious ladies. But he froze before he came near the knot of well-wishers, the sight beyond them causing Ruse the unpleasant sensation of his ample guts dropping right out of his ass. There, in the distant sweep of beige beyond the bridge, an infestation of black dots was gathering, plumes of dust rising from the swarm. He might not have been good for much, but Ruse had always possessed an unerring sense for danger. He lifted a trembling arm. The Gurkish! he wailed. What? Someone laughed uncertainly. There! To the west! That's east, fool! Wait, you're serious? We'll be slaughtered in our beds! We're not in our beds! Silence! roared Veruz. This isn't a damn finishing school! The hubbub died, the officers brought instantly to guilty quiet. Major Mitrick! I want you to get down there now and hurry the men along. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Valamir, would you be good enough to conduct the ladies and our civilian guests to safety? Of course, sir. A few men could hold them at that bridge, Colonel Polder was saying, tugging at his lustrous moustaches. A few heroes, said Veruz. A few dead heroes, said Colonel Croy under his breath. Do you have fresh men? asked Veruz. Polder shrugged. Mine are blown. Mine too, added Croy. Even more so. As though the whole war was a competition at exhausting your regiment. Colonel Glockter slapped his battle steel back into its sheath. My men are fresh, he said, and Ruse felt the fear creeping out from his stomach to every extremity. They'd been resting up after that last little jaunt of ours, chomping at the bit to have at the enemy. I dare say His Majesty's first would be willing to hold that bridge long enough to get the men clear, Lord Marshal. Chomping at the bit, brayed one of Glockter's staff, clearly too drunk to realize what he was volunteering for. Another, a little less drunk, blinked nervously towards the valley. Ruse wondered how many men in His Majesty's first the colonel could be speaking of. The regiment's quartermaster was in no hurry to give his life for the greater good, of that he was absolutely positive. But Lord Marshal Veruse had not become commander of the Union Army by preventing people from sacrificing themselves to make up for his oversights. He slapped Glockter warmly on the arm. I knew I could rely on you, my friend. Of course, sir and Ruse reflected, with mounting horror, that it was true. 
Glockter could always be relied upon to jump at the faintest hint of vainglorious showing off, regardless of how fatal it might be for those who followed him into the jaws of death. Varus and Glockter, commander and favoured officer, fencing master and finest pupil, and as big a pair of bastards as one could find in a year of searching, drew themselves up and gave each other a salute vibrating with feigned emotion. Then Varuz swept away, snapping orders to Polder and Croy and his own gaggle of bastards, presumably to hurry the army to safety and make the sacrifice of His Majesty's first worthwhile. Because, Ruse realized as he looked towards the gathering Gurkish storm on the far side of the bridge, this was most certainly going to be a sacrifice. This is suicide, he whispered to himself. Corporal Tunney, called Glockter, buttoning his jacket. Sir? The keenest of young soldiers snapped out the keenest of salutes. Could you bring me my breastplate? Of course, sir. And off he ran to get it. There were a lot of people running to get things. Officers to get soldiers, men to get horses, civilians to get away. Lady Wetterland with a dewy-eyed glance over her shoulder. Ruse was quartermaster of the regiment, wasn't he? He should have some urgent business to be about. And yet he could only stand there, his own eyes very wide and more than a little dewy themselves, mouth and hands opening and closing to no purpose whatsoever. Two very different kinds of courage were on display. Lieutenant West was frowning towards the bridge, his face pale and his jaw clenched, determined to do his duty in spite of his very real fear. Colonel Glockter, meanwhile, smirked at death, as though it were a jilted lover begging for more, entirely fearless in his certain knowledge that danger was something that applied only to the little people. Three kinds of courage were on display. Ruse realized, because he was there too, displaying what a total lack of it looked like. And indeed, a fourth soon arrived in the form of young Corporal Tunney, sun gleaming on his highly polished strapping, Glockter's breastplate in his eager hands, eyes bright with the courage of untried youth desperate to prove itself. Thank you, said Glockter, as Tunney did up the buckles, his narrowed eyes focused on the gathering body of Gurkish cavalry beyond the river, more horses appearing with frightening speed. Now I'd like you to hop back to the tent and get my things squared away. Tunney's face was a picture of shocked disappointment. I was hoping to ride down there with you, sir. Of course you were, and I'd like nothing better than to have you at my side— but if we both die down there, who'll take my personal effects back to mother? The young corporal blinked away tears. But, sir, come, come, and Glockter slapped him on the shoulder. I wouldn't wish to cut short a glittering career. I've no doubt you'll make Lord Marshal one of these days. Glockter turned his back on the stunned corporal and hence dismissed him utterly from his mind. Captain Lackenhorn, would you mind going to the enlisted men and asking for volunteers? The prominent lump on the front of Lackenhorn's stringy neck bobbed uncertainly. Volunteers for what duty, Colonel? Though the duty was obvious enough, set out clearly before them all in the valley below, a vast melodrama slowly unfolding on a grand stage. Why— to clear the Gurkish from that bridge, you silly old goat. Quick now, and get them armed and ready, sharp as you like. The man gave a nervous smile and hurried away, partly tangled with his sword. Glockter sprang up onto the fence, one boot on the lower rail and one on the upper. I plan to teach these Gurkish a little lesson today, my proud boys of His Majesty's First. The young officers crowded eagerly about him, just as though they were ducks and Glockter's heroic platitudes were crumbs. I won't order anyone to come. Let the decision be on each man's conscience. He curled his lip. How about you, Ruse? Will you be waddling after us? 
Ruse thought his conscience could probably bear the strain. I would like nothing better than to join the charge, Colonel, but my leg, Glockter snorted. I understand entirely. Carrying that body of yours around is a challenge for any leg. I wouldn't want to inflict such a burden on some undeserving horse. Widespread laughter. Some men are made to do great things, others to do whatever it is you do. Of course you're excused, Ruse. How could you not be? The crushing insult was altogether drowned in a giddy wave of relief. He who laughs last, after all, laughs loudest, and Ruse doubted many of his tormentors would be laughing in an hour's time. Sir, West was saying, as the colonel swung from the fence into his saddle with the agility of an acrobat, Are you sure we have to do this? Who else do you suppose is going to? asked Glockter, jerking the reins and pulling his steed savagely about. A lot of men will surely die, men with families. Why, yes, I expect so. It is a war, Lieutenant a scattering of obsequious laughter from the other officers. That's what we're here for. Of course, sir, West swallowed. Corporal Tunney, will you be good enough to settle my horse? No, Lieutenant West, said Glockter. I need you to stay here. Sir? When this is all over, I'll require an officer or two who can tell his ass from a pair of melons. He directed a withering glance at Ruse, who hitched his wrinkled trousers up a little. Besides, I suspect that sister of yours will grow up to be quite a handful. Couldn't rob her of your sobering influence, could I? But, Colonel, I should— Won't hear of it, West. You'll stay, and that's an order. West opened his mouth as if to speak, then smartly shut it, drew himself up, and gave a rigid salute. Corporal Tunney did the same, the shimmering of a tear at the corner of his eye. Ruse crept guiltily to follow suit, light-headed with horror and delight at the thought of a glockterless universe. The colonel grinned at them, his full complement of perfect, brilliantly white teeth, almost painful to look upon in the sun's bright glare. Come now, gentlemen, don't be maudlin. I'll be back before you know it. With a jerk on the reins, he caused his horse to rear, frozen for an instant against the bright sky, like one of those heroic statues, and Ruse wondered if there could ever have been a more beautiful bastard. Then the dust showered in his face as Glockter thundered down the hillside, down towards the bridge. Small Kindnesses Westport, Autumn 573 When Chev arrived to open up that morning, there were a pair of big, dirty, bare feet sticking out of the doorway of her smokehouse. That might once have caused her quite the shock, but over the last couple of years, Chev had come to consider herself past shocking. Oi! she shouted, striding up with her fists clenched. Whoever it was on their face in the doorway either chose not to move or was unable. She saw the long legs the feet were attached to, clad in trousers ripped and stained, then the ragged mess of a torn and filthy coat. Finally, wedged into the grubby corner against Chev's door, a tangle of long red hair, matted with twigs and dirt. A big man, without a doubt. The one hand Chev could see was as long as her foot, netted with veins, filthy, and scabbed across the knuckles. There was a strange shape to it, though, slender. Oi! She jabbed the toe of her boot into the coat around where she judged the man's ass to be. Still nothing. She heard footsteps behind her. Morning, boss. Severard, turning up for the day. Never late, that boy. 
Not the most careful in his work, but for punctuality you couldn't knock him. What's this you've caught? A strange fish, all right, to wash up in my doorway. Chev scraped some of the red hair back, wrinkled her nose, as she realised it was clotted with blood. Is he drunk? She. It was a woman's face under there. Strong-jawed and strong-boned, pale skin crowded with enough black scab, red greys and purple bruise to make Chev wince, even if she rarely saw anyone who wasn't carrying a wound or two. Severard gave a soft whistle. That's a lot of she. And someone's given her a lot of beating, too. Chev leaned close to put her cheek near the woman's battered mouth, heard the faintest wheezing of breath. Alive, though. Then she rocked away and squatted there, wrists on her knees and her hands dangling, wondering what to do. There'd been a time she just dived into whatever messes presented themselves without a backward glance, but somehow the consequences always lurked nearer to hand than they used to. She puffed her cheeks out and gave the weariest of sighs. Well, it happens, said Severard. Sadly, yes. Not our problem, is it? Happily, no. Want me to drag her into the street? Yes, I want that quite a lot. And Chev rolled her eyes skywards and gave another sigh, maybe even wearier than the last. But we'd best drag her inside, I reckon. You sure, boss? You remember the last time we helped someone out? Sure? No. Chev didn't know, after all the shit that had been done to her, why she still felt the need to do small kindnesses. Maybe because of all the shit that had been done to her. Maybe there was some stubborn stone in her, like the stone in a date, that refused to let all the shit that had been done to her make her into shit. She turned the key and elbowed the door wobbling open. You get her feet. When you run a smokehouse, you'd better get good at shifting limp bodies, but the latest recipient of Chev's half assed charity proved quite the challenge. Bloody hell, grunted Severard, eyes popping as they manhandled the woman down the stale-smelling corridor, her backside scuffing the boards. What's she made of? Anvils? Anvils? A lighter? groaned Chev through her gritted teeth, waddling from side to side under the dead weight of her, bouncing off the peeling walls. She gasped as she kicked open the door to her office, or the broom cupboard she called an office. She strained with every burning muscle as she hauled the woman up, knocked her limp head on the doorframe as she wrestled her through, then tripped on a mop, and with a despairing squawk, toppled back onto the cot with the woman on top of her. In bed under a redhead was nothing to object to, but Chev preferred them at least partly conscious, preferred them sweeter smelling too, at least when they got into bed. This one stank like sour sweat and rot and the very end of things. That's where kindness gets you, said Severard, chuckling away to himself, wedged under a mighty weight of trouble. You gonna giggle or help me out, you bastard? snarled Chev, slack springs groaning as she struggled from underneath, then hauled the woman's legs onto the bed, feet dangling well off the end. It wasn't a big bed, but it looked like a child's with her on it. Her ragged coat had fallen open, and the stained leather vest she wore beneath it had got dragged right up. When Chev spent a year tumbling with that travelling show, there'd been a strong man called himself the Amazing Zaraquan though his real name had been Runkin. Used to strip to the waist and oil himself up and lift all kinds of heavy things for the crowd, though once he was off stage and toweled down, you couldn't get the lazy oaf to lift a thimble for you. His stomach had been all jutting knots of muscle, as if beneath his tight-stretched skin he was made of wood rather than meat. This woman's pale midriff reminded Chev of the amazing Zaraquans, but narrower, longer, and even leaner. You could see all the little sinews in between her ribs, shifting with each shallow breath. 
but instead of oil, her stomach was covered in black and blue and purple bruises. Plus, a great red welt looked like it had been left by a most unfriendly axe handle. Severard whistled softly. They really did give her a beating, didn't they? Aye, they did. Chev knew well enough what that felt like, and she winced as she twitched the woman's vest down, then dragged the blanket up and laid it over her. Tucked it in a little around her neck, though she felt a fool doing it, and the woman mumbled something and twisted onto her side, matted hair fluttering over her mouth as she started to snore. Sweet dreams, Chev muttered, not that she ever got any herself. Wasn't as if she really needed a bed here, but when you've spent a few years with nowhere safe to sleep, you tend to make a bed in every halfway safe place you can find. She took the memories off and herded Severard back into the corridor. Best get the doors open. We aren't pulling in so much business we can let it slip by. Folk really after husk at this time in the morning? asked Severard, trying to wipe a smear of the woman's blood off his hand. If you want to forget your troubles, why live with them till lunchtime? By daylight, the smoking room was far from the alluring little cave of wonders Chev had dreamed of making when she bought the place. She planted her hands on her hips as she looked around and gave that weary sigh again. Fact was, it bore more than a passing resemblance to an utter shithole. The boards were split and stained and riddled with splinters, and the cushions greasy as a bowelish kitchen, and one of the cheap hangings had come away to show the mold-blooming plaster behind. The prayer bells on the shelf were the only things that lent the faintest touch of class, and Chev gave the big one an affectionate stroke, then went up on tiptoe to pin the corner of that hanging back where it belonged, so at least the mould was hidden from her eyes, even if her nose was still well aware of it, the smell of rotten onions all pervasive. Even a liar as practised as Chev couldn't have convinced a fool as gullible as Chev that it wasn't a shithole. But it was her shithole, and she had plans to improve it. She always had plans. You clean the pipes? she asked as Severard stomped back from opening the doors, brushing the curtain aside. The folk who come here don't care about clean pipes, boss. Chev frowned. I care. We may not have the biggest place, or the most comfortable, or the best husk, she raised her brows at Severard's spotty face, or the prettiest folk to light it for you. So what's our advantage over our competitors? We're cheap? No, 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 she thought about that. Well, yes, but what else? Severard sighed. Customer service. Ding, said Chev, flicking the biggest prayer bell and making it give off that heavenly song. So clean the pipes, you lazy shit, and get some coals lit. Severard puffed out his cheeks, patched with the kind of downy beard that's meant to make a boy look manly, but actually makes him look all the more boyish. Yes, boss. As he went out the back, Chev heard footsteps coming in the front, and she propped her hands on the counter, or the hacked-up piece of butcher's block she'd salvaged off a rubbish heap and polished smooth, and put on her professional manner. She'd copied it from Gusman, the carpet seller, who was the best damn merchant she knew. He had a way of looking like a carpet was sure to be the answer to all your problems. The professional manner slid off straight away when Chev saw who came strutting into her place. Karkov, she breathed. God, Karkov was trouble. Tall, blonde, beautiful trouble. Sweet-smelling, sweet-smiling, quick-thinking, quick-fingered trouble, as subtle as the rain and as trustworthy as the wind. Chev looked her up and down. Her eyes didn't give her much choice in the matter. Well, my day's looking better, she muttered. Mine too, said Karkov, brushing past the curtain so the sunlight shone through her hair from behind. It's been too long, Chevedia. The room looked vastly improved with Karkov in it. 
you wouldn't find a better ornament than her in any bazaar in Westport. Her clothes weren't tight, but they stuck in all the right places, and she had this way of cocking her hips. God, those hips! They went all over the place, like they weren't attached to a spine like everyone else's. Chev heard she'd been a dancer. The day she quit had been a loss to dancing and a gain to fraud without a doubt. Come for a smoke? asked Chev. Karkol smiled. I like to keep a clear head. How can you enjoy life otherwise? Guess it depends whether your life's enjoyable or not. Minus, she said, prancing around the place like it was hers, and Chev was a valued guest. What do you think of Talon's? Never liked it, muttered Chev. I've got a job there. Always loved the place. I need a partner. The prayer bells weren't all that low down. Even so, Karkov bent over to get a good look at them. Entirely innocently, it would appear. But Chev doubted Karkov ever did an innocent thing in her life, especially bend over. I need someone I can trust. Someone to watch my ass. Chev's voice came hoarse. If that's what you want, you've come to the right girl. But— And she tore her eyes away as her mind came knocking like an unwelcome visitor. That's not all you're after, is it? I dare say it wouldn't hurt if this partner of yours could pick a lock or a pocket either. Karkov grinned as if the idea had only just come to her. It wouldn't hurt. Be good if she could keep her mouth shut, too. And she drifted over to Chev, looking down at her, since she was a good few inches taller. Most people were. Except when I wanted her mouth open, of course. I'm not an idiot. You'd be no use to me if you were. I go with you. I'll likely end up abandoned in some alley with nothing but the clothes I'm standing in. Karkov leaned even closer to whisper, Chev's head full of the scent of her, which was a far stretch more appealing than rotten onions or sweaty redhead. I'm thinking of you lying down, and without your clothes. Chev made a squeak like a rusty hinge, but she forced herself not to grab hold of Karkov like a drowning girl to a beautiful, beautiful log. She'd been thinking between her legs too long. Time to think between her ears. I don't do that kind of work anymore. I've got this place to worry about, and Severard to look after, I guess. Still trying to set the world to right, see? Not all of it, just a bit at my elbow. You can't make every stray your problem, Shevedia. Not every stray, just this one. She thought of the great big woman in her bed. Just a couple of them. You know he's in love with you. All I did was help him out. That's why he's in love with you. No one else ever has. Karkov reached out and gently brushed a stray strand of hair out of Chev's face with a fingertip and gave a sigh. Is that boy knocking at the wrong gate, poor thing? Chev caught her wrist and guided it away. Being small didn't mean you could let folk just walk all over you. He's not the only one. She held Karkov's eye, made her voice calm and level. I enjoy the act. God knows I enjoy it. But I'd rather you stopped. If you want me just for me, my door's always open. And my legs shortly after. If you want me so you can squeeze me out like a lemon and toss my empty skin aside in talons, well, no offence, but I'd rather not. Karkov winced down at the floor. Not so pretty as the smile, but a lot more honest. Not sure you'd like me without the act. Why don't we try it and see? Too much to lose, muttered Karkov, and she twisted her hand free, and when she looked up, the act was on again. Well, if you change your mind, it'll be too late. And with a smile over her shoulder, deadly as a knife blade, Karkov walked out. God, that walk she had, flowing like syrup on a warm day. How did she get it? Did she practice in front of a mirror? Hours every day, more than likely. 
The door shut, and the spell was broken, and Chev let go that weary sigh again. Was that Karkov? asked Severard. It was, murmured Chev, all wistful, a trace of that heavenly scent still battling the mould in her nostrils. I don't trust that bitch, Chev snorted. Fuck no. How do you know her? From around, from all around Chev's bed and never quite in it. The two of you seem close, said Severard. Not half as close as I'd like to be, she muttered. You clean the pipes? I. Chev heard the door again, turned, with a smile stuck halfway between carpet seller and needy lover. Maybe it was Karkov come back, decided she wanted Chev just for Chev. Oh, God, she muttered, face falling. Usually it took her at least a little longer than that to regret a decision. Morning, Shevidia, said Crandall. He was trouble of an altogether less pleasant variety. A rat-faced little nothing, thin at the shoulders and slender in the wits, pink at the eyes and runny at the nose. But he was Horold the Fingers' son, and that made him a whole lot of something in this town. A rat-faced little nothing with power he hadn't earned, which made him tetchy brutal and prickly spiteful, and jealous of anything anyone had that he didn't. And everyone had something he didn't, even if it was just talent or looks or a shred of self-respect. Chev hitched that professional smile back up, though it was hard to think of anyone she wanted less in her place. Morning, Crandall. Morning, Mason. Mason ducked in just behind his boss, or his boss's son, anyway. He was one of Horold's boys from way back, broad face, crisscrossed with scars, ears all cauliflowered up, and a nose so often broken it was shapeless as a turnip. He was as hard a bastard as you'd find anywhere in Westport, where hard bastards were in plentiful supply. He looked over at Chev, still stooping on account of his towering frame and the low ceiling, and gave an apologetic twitch of the mouth, as if to say, Sorry, but none of this is up to me. It's up to this fool. The fool in question was peering at Chev's prayer bells, and without bending down, mouth all twisted with contempt. What's these? Bells? Prayer bells, said Chev. From Thond. She tried to keep her voice calm as three more men crowded past Mason into her place, trying to look dangerous but finding the room too tight for anything but uncomfortable. One had a face all pocked from old boils and eyes bulging right out. Another had a leather coat far too big for him, got tangled with a curtain and near tore it down, thrashing it away, and the last had his hands shoved deep in his pockets and a look that said he had knives in there. No doubt he did. Chev doubted she'd ever had so many folk in her place at once. Sadly, they weren't paying. She glanced at Severard, saw him shifting nervously, licking his lips, held out her palm to say, Calm, calm, though she had to admit she wasn't feeling too calm herself. Didn't think you'd be much for prayer said Crandall, wrinkling his nose at the bells. I'm not, said Chev. I just like the bells. They lend the place a spiritual quality. You want to smoke? No, and if I did, I wouldn't come to a shithole like this. There was a silence, then the pock-faced one leaned towards her. He said it's a shithole. I heard him, said Chev. Sound carries in a room small as this one, and I'm well aware it's a shithole. I've got plans to improve it. Crandall smiled. You've always got plans, Chev. They never come to nothing. True enough, and mostly on account of bastards like this. Maybe my luck'll change, said Chev. What do you want? I want something stolen. Why else would I come to a thief? I'm not a thief anymore. Of course you are. 
You're just a thief playing at running a shithole smokehouse. And you owe me. What do I owe you for? Crandall's face twisted in a vicious grin. For every day you don't have a pair of broken legs. Chev swallowed. Seemed he'd somehow managed to become more of a bastard than ever. Mason's deep voice rumbled out, soft and calming. It's just a waste, is what it is. Westport has lost a hell of a thief and gained a very average husk seller. How old are you? Nineteen? Twenty-one? Though she sometimes felt a hundred. I'm blessed with a youthful glow. Still far too young to retire. I'm about the right age, said Chev. Still alive. That could change, said Crandall, stepping close. As close to Chev as Karkov had been, and a very great deal less welcome. Give the lady some room, said Severard, lip stuck out defiantly. Crandall snorted. Lady? Are you fucking serious, boy? Chev saw Severard had that stick of hers behind his back. Nice length of wood it was, just the right weight for knocking someone on the head. But the very last thing she needed was him swinging that stick at Crandall. He'd be carrying it up his ass by the time Mason was through with him. Why don't you go out back and sweep the yard, said Chev. Severard looked at her, jaw all set for action, the fool. God, maybe he was in love with her. I don't want... Go out back. I'll be fine. He swallowed, shot the heavies one more glance, then slid out. Chev gave a sharp whistle, brought all the hard eyes back to her. She knew well enough what having no choice looked like. This thing you want. If I steal it, is that the last of it? Crandall shrugged. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. Depends whether I want something stolen again, don't it? Whether your daddy does, you mean? Crandall's eye twitched. He didn't like being reminded he was just a little prick in his daddy's big shadow. But Chev was always saying the wrong thing, or the right thing at the wrong time, or the right thing at the right time to the wrong person, maybe. You'll do as you're told, you little gash-licking bitch, he spat in her face, or I'll burn your shithole down with you in it, and your fucking prayer bells, too. Mason gave a disgusted sigh, scarred cheeks puffed out, as if to say, He's a rat-faced little nothing, but what can I do? Chev stared at Crandall. Damn, but she wanted to butt him in the face. Wanted to with all her being. She'd had bastards like this kicking her around her whole life. Almost be worth it to kick back just once. But she knew all she could do was smile. If she hurt Crandall, Mason would hurt her ten times as bad. He wouldn't like it, but he'd do it. He made a living doing things he didn't like. Didn't they all? Chev swallowed, tried to make her fury look like fear. The deck was always stacked against folk like her. Guess I haven't got a choice. Crandall blasted her with shitty breath as he smiled. Who does? Never consider the ground. That's the trick to it. Chev straddled the slimy angle of the roof, broken tiles jabbing her in the groin as she inched along, thinking about how much she'd rather be straddling Karkov. Down in the busy street to her right, some drunk idiots were haw-hawing way too loud over a joke, someone else blabbering in suljuk, which Chev didn't understand more than one word in thirty of. Down in the empty alleyway on her left, it seemed quiet, though. She inched to the chimney, keeping low, just a shadow in the darkness, slipped the loop of her rope over it. Looked solid enough, but she gave a good heave to check. Verini used to tell her she weighed two-thirds of nothing, but even so, she'd almost dragged a chimney clean off once, and would have taken a tumble into the street with half a ton of masonry on her head, if not for a luckily placed window sill. Careful, careful, that's the trick. But a healthy streak of good luck doesn't hurt either. Her heart was pounding now, and she took a long breath and tried to settle it. Out of practice was all. 
She was the best thief in Westport, that was well known. That was why they wouldn't let her stop. Why she wouldn't let her stop. That was her blessing and her curse. Best thief in Westport, she muttered to herself, and slid down the rope to the edge of the roof peering over. She could see the two guards flanking the doorway, lamplight gleaming on their helmets. About the right time, and she heard the whore's voices, shrill and angry, saw the guards' heads turn. More shrieking, and she caught the briefest glimpse of the women struggling before they went down in the gutter. The guards were drifting down the alleyway to watch, and Shev smiled to herself. Those girls put on a hell of a show for a couple of silvers. Seize your moment. That's the trick to it. In a twinkling, she swung over the eaves, down the rope, and in through the window. It had only taken a few coppers to get the maid to leave the shutters off the latch. She pulled them too as she dropped onto the other side. Someone was on their way down the stairs, a light tread, unhurried, but Chev was taking no chances. She nipped the candle and pinched it out with her gloved fingers, sank the corridor into comfortable darkness. The rope would still be dangling, but there wasn't much to do about that. Couldn't afford a partner to hoist it back up. Have to hope she was long gone by the time they noticed. In and out quick, that's the trick to it. She could still hear the whores screeching in the street, no doubt having attracted quite the crowd by now, folk betting on the outcome and everything. There's something about women fighting that men can never seem to take their eyes away from especially if the women in question aren't wearing much. Shev hooked a finger in her collar and dragged a bit of air in, squashing a stray instinct to go and take a peek herself, and padded softly down the corridor to the third door, already slipping out her picks. It was a damn good lock. Most thieves wouldn't have even bothered with it, would have moved along to something easier. But Shev wasn't most thieves. She shut her eyes and touched the tip of her tongue to her top lip and slid her picks inside and started to work the lock. It only took her a few moments to tease out the innards of it to tickle the tumblers her way. It gave a little metal gasp as it opened up for her, and Shev slipped her tongue and her picks away, eased the knob around, though she was a lot less interested in knobs than locks, being honest, worked the door open a crack and slipped through just as she heard the boots on the stairs and felt herself grinning in the darkness. She hadn't wanted to admit it, least of all to herself, but God, she'd missed this. The fear, the excitement, the stakes, the thrill of taking what wasn't hers, the thrill of knowing how damn good she was at it. Best fucking thief in Westport, she mouthed and eased over to the table. The satchel was where Crandall had said it would be, and she slipped the strap over her shoulder in blissful, velvet silence. Everything just the way she'd planned. Chev turned back towards the door, and a board creaked under her heel. A woman sat bolt upright in the bed, a woman in a pale nightdress staring straight at her. There wasn't supposed to be anyone in here. Chev raised her gloved hand. This is nothing like it looks. The woman let go the most piercing scream Shev ever heard in her life. Cleverness, caution, and plans will only get a thief so far. Then luck's a treacherous bitch and won't always play along, so boldness will have to take you the rest of the way. Shev raced to the window, raised her black boot, and gave the shutters an almighty kick, splintering the latch, and sent them shuddering open as the woman heaved in a whooping breath. A square of night sky, the second story of the buildings across the way. She caught a glimpse of a man with his head in his hands through the window directly opposite. She thought about how far down it was and made herself stop. You can't think about the ground. The woman let blast another bladder-loosening scream. Chev heard the door wrenched wide, guards yelling. She jumped through. Wind tugged, flapped at her clothes, that lurching in her stomach as she started to fall, like doing the high drop when she was tumbling with that travelling show, hands straining to catch Varini's. 
the reassuring smack of her palms into his and the puff of chalk as he whisked her up to safety. Every time. Every time but that last time when he'd had a drink too many and the ground had caught her instead. She let it happen. Once you're falling, you can't fight it. There's an urge to flail and struggle, but the air won't help you. No one will. No one ever will, in her experience. With a teeth-rattling thud, she dropped straight into the wagon of fleeces she'd paid Jens to leave under the window. He looked suitably amazed to see her floundering out from his cargo, dragging the satchel after her and scurrying across the street, weaving between the people and into the darkness, between the ale shop and the ostlers, the shouting fading behind her. She reeled against the wall, gripping at her side, growling with each breath and trying not to cry out. Rim of the cart had caught her in the ribs, and from the sick pain and the way her head was spinning, she reckoned at least one was broken, probably a few more. Fucking ouch, she forced through gritted teeth. She glanced back towards the building as Jens shouted to his mule and the wagon rolled off a guard leaning out of the open window, pointing wildly across the street towards her. She saw someone slip out of a side door and gently push it closed. Someone tall and slim, a strand of blonde hair falling from a black hat and a satchel over her shoulder. Someone with a hell of a walk, hip swaying as she drifted quietly into the shadows. The guard roared something, and Chev turned, stumbled on down the alley, squeezed through the little crack in the wall, and away. Now she remembered why she'd wanted to stop and run a smokehouse instead. Most thieves don't last long. Not even the good ones. You're hurt, said Severard. Chev really was hurt, but she'd learned to keep her hurts as hidden as she could. In her experience, people were like sharks. Blood in the water only made them hungry. So she shook her head, tried to smile, tried to look not hurt, with her face twisted up and sweaty, and her hand clamped to her ribs. It's nothing. We got customers. Just Berwick. He nodded towards the old husk head, sprawled out on the greasy cushions, with eyes closed and mouth open, spent pipe beside him. When did he smoke? Couple of hours passed. Chev gripped her side tight as she knelt beside him, touched him gently on the cheek. Beric, best wake up now. His eyes fluttered open, and he saw Chev and his lined face suddenly crushed up. She's dead, he whispered. Keep remembering it fresh. She's dead and he closed his eyes and squeezed tears down his pale cheeks. I know, said Chev. I know, and I'm sorry. I'd usually let you stay long as you need, and I hate to do this, but you've got to get up, Beric. Might be trouble. You can come back later. See him home, eh, Severard? I should stay here. I can watch your back. More likely he'd do something stupid and get the pair of them killed. I've been watching my own back long as I can... I've been watching my own back long as I can remember. Go feed your birds. Fed them already. Feed them again, then. Just promise me you'll stay out till Crandall's come and gone. Severard worked his spotty jaw, sullen. Shit, the boy really was in love with her. I promise. And he slipped an arm under Beric's and helped him stagger out of the door. Two less little worries, but still the big one to negotiate. Chev stared about, wondering how she could be ready for Crandall's visit. Routes of escape, hidden weapons, backup plans in case something went wrong. The coals they used to light the pipes were smouldering away in the tin bowl on their stand. Chev picked up the water jug, thinking to douse them, then reckoned maybe she could fling them in someone's face if she had to, and moved the stand back against the wall in easy reach instead coals sliding and popping as she set it down. Evening, Chev. She spun about, trying not to wince at the stab of pain in her side. For a big, big man, Mason sure had a light tread when he felt the need. 
Crandall ducked into the smokehouse, looking even more sour than usual. She watched two of his thugs crowd in behind him. Big coat, with his big coat on, and hands in pockets, with his hands still stuffed in his pockets. The door to the yard creaked open, and Pockface sidled through and shouldered it shut. So much for the escape route, Chev swallowed. Just say as little as possible, do nothing to rile them, and get them out quick as she could. That was the trick to it. Black suits you, said Mason, looking her up and down. That's why I wear it, she said, trying to come across relaxed, but only managing queasy. That and the thieving. Got it, snapped Crandall. Chev slipped the satchel from under the counter and tossed it to him, strap flapping. Good girl, he said as he caught it. Did you open it? None of my business. Crandall pulled the satchel open. He poked around inside. He looked up at her, with far from the satisfied customer expression she'd been hoping for. It's a fucking joke. Why would it be? It's not here. What's not? What was supposed to be in here? Crandall shook the satchel at her, and the frowns his men wore grew a little bit harder. Chev swallowed again, a sinking feeling in her gut like she was standing at a cliff edge and could feel the earth crumbling at her feet. You didn't say there'd be anything in it. You didn't say there'd be some champion screamer in the room either. You said, get the satchel, and I got it. Crandall flung the empty satchel on the floor. Thought you'd fucking sell it to someone else, didn't you? What? I don't even know what it is. And if I'd screwed you, I wouldn't be standing here waiting with nothing but a smile, would I? Take me for a fool, do you? Think I didn't see Karkov leaving here earlier? Karkov? She just came because she had a job in Tallinn's. Chev trailed off with that same feeling she'd felt when her hand slipped from Verini's and she'd seen the ground flying up to greet her. Crandall's men shifted. Pockface pulling a jagged-edged knife out, and Mason gave a grimace even bigger than usual and slowly shook his head. Oh, God. Karkov had finally fucked her. But not in a good way. Not in a good way at all. Chev held her hands up, calming, trying to give herself time to think of something. Look, you said get the satchel, and I got it. She hated the whine in her voice, knew there was no point begging, but couldn't help herself. Looked to the doors, the thugs slowly closing on her, knew the only question left was how bad they'd hurt her. Crandall stepped towards her, face twisting. Look! she screeched, and he punched her in the side. Far from the hardest punch she'd ever taken, but as bad luck had it, his fist landed right where the wagon had. There was a flash of pain through her guts and straight away she doubled up and puked all down his trousers. Oh, that's it, you fucking little bitch! Hold her! The one with the pocked face caught her left arm, and the one with the stupid coat her right, and stuck his forearm in her throat and pinned her against the wall, both of them grinning like it was a while since they'd had so much fun. Chev could have been enjoying herself more, as Pockface waved his knife in her face, her mouth acrid with sick, and her side on fire, and her eyes crossed as she stared at the bright point. Crandall snapped his fingers at Mason. Give me your axe. Mason puffed his cheeks out. More than likely, it's that bitch Karkov behind all this. Nothing Shvedia could have done. We kill her, she can't help us find what we're after, eh? It's past business now, said Crandall, the little rat-faced nothing, and on to teaching a lesson. What lesson will this teach, and to who? Just give me a fucking axe. Mason didn't like it, but he made a living doing things he didn't like. Wasn't as if this crossed some line. His expression said, I'm real sorry but he pulled out his hatchet and slapped the polished handle into Crandall's palm anyway, turning away in disgust.
Shev twisted like a worm cut in half, but could hardly breathe for the pain in her ribs, and the two bastards had her fast. Crandall leaned closer, caught a fistful of her shirt, and twisted it. I would say it's been nice knowing you, but it fucking hasn't. Try not to spatter me this time, boss, said Pockface, closing the bulging eye nearest to her so he didn't get her brains in it. Chev gave a stupid whimper, squeezing her eyes shut as Crandall raised the axe. So, that was it then, was it? That was her life? A shit one when you thought about it. A few good moments shared with halfway decent folk. A few small kindnesses done. A few little victories clawed from all those defeats. She'd always supposed the good stuff was coming. The good stuff she'd be given. The good stuff she'd give. Turned out, this was all there was. It is a long time since I last saw prayer bells. Chev opened her eyes again. The red-haired woman she'd dragged into her bed that morning and forgotten all about was standing larger than life in Chev's smoking room in that ripped leather vest, peering at the bells on the shelf. This is a very fine one, and she brushed the bronze with her scabbed fingertips. Second dynasty. Who's this fucking joker? snarled Crandall, weighing the hatchet in his hand. Her eyes shifted lazily over to him, or the one eye Chev could see did, tangled red hair hanging across the other. That hard-boned face was spattered with bruises, the nose cut and swollen and crusted with blood, the lips split and bloated. But she had this look in that one bloodshot eye as it flickered across Crandall and his four thugs, lingered on Mason a moment, then away. An easy contempt, as though she'd taken their whole measure in that single glance and wasn't troubled by it one bit. I am Jevre, said the woman Chev found unconscious in her doorway. She had some strange kind of an accent, from up north somewhere, maybe. Lioness of Hoskop, and, far from being a joker, I am in fact often told I have a poor sense of humor. Who put me to bed? Pinned against the wall by three men, the most Chev could do was raise one finger. Javra nodded. That was a kindness I will not forget. Do you have my sword? Sword? Chev managed to croak, the forearm across her throat easing off as its owner turned to sneer at the new arrival. Javra hissed through her teeth. It could be very dangerous if it fell into the wrong hands. It is forged from the metal of a fallen star. She's mad, said Crandall. Fuck in loan, grunted hands in pockets. Lioness of Hoskop said Big Coat, and gave a little giggle. I will have to steal it back, she was musing. Do any of you know a decent thief? There was a pause, then Chev raised that one finger again. Ah! Javra's blood-clotted brow went up. It is said the goddess places the right people in each other's paths. She frowned as though she was only just making sense of the situation. Are these men inconveniencing you? A little, Chev whispered, grimacing at the dull ache that had spread from her side right to the tips of her fingers. Best to check. You never can tell what people enjoy. Javra slowly worked her bare shoulders. They reminded Chev of the amazing Zaraquans, too, woody hard and split into a hundred little fluttering shreds of muscle. I will ask you once to put the dark-skinned girl down and leave. Crandall snorted. And if we don't? That one eye narrowed slightly. Then long after we are gone to the goddess, the grandchildren of the grandchildren of those who witness will whisper fearful stories of the way I broke you. Hands in pockets shoved his hands down further still. You ain't even got a weapon he snarled. But Javra only smiled. My friend, I am the weapon.
Crandall jerked his head towards her. Put this bitch out of my misery. Pockface and Big Coat let go of Chev, which was a blessing, but closed in towards Javra, which didn't seem to be. Big Coat pulled a stick from his coat, which was a little disappointing, since he had ample room for a greatsword in there. Pockface spun his jagged-edged dagger around in his fingers and stuck out his tongue, which was uglier than the blade, if anything. Javra just stood, hands on her hips. Well, do you await a written invitation? Pockface lunged at her, but his knife caught nothing. She dodged with a speed even Shiv could hardly follow, and her white hand flashed out and chopped him across the side of the neck with a sound like a cleaver chopping meat. He dropped as if he had no bones in him at all, knife bouncing from his hand, flopping and thrashing on the floor like a landed fish, spitting and gurgling, and his eyes popping out further than ever. Big Coat hit her in the side with his stick. If he'd hit a pillar, that was the sound of it. Javra hardly even flinched. Muscle bulged in her arm as she sank her fist into his gut, and he bent right over with a breathy wheeze. Javra caught him by the hair with her big right fist and smashed his head into Shev's butcher block counter, blood spattering the cheap hangings. Shit, breathed Crandall, the hand he was holding Shev with going limp. Javra looked over at the one with his hands rammed in his pockets, whose mouth had just dropped open. No need to feel embarrassed, she said. If I had a cock, I would play with it all the time, too. He jerked his hands out and flung a knife. Shev saw the metal flicker, heard the blade twitter. Javra caught it. She made no big show of it, like the jugglers in that travelling show used to. She simply plucked it from the air as easily as you might catch a coin you'd tossed yourself. Thank you, she said. She tossed it back, and it thudded into the man's thigh. He gave a great spitty screech as he staggered back through the doorway and into the street. Mason had just pulled his own knife out, a monster of a thing you could have called a sword without much fear of correction. Javra planted her hands on her hips again. Are you sure this is the way you want it? Can't say I want it, said Mason, drifting into a fighting crouch. But there's no other way for it to be. I know. Javra shook her shoulders again and raised those big empty hands. But it is always worth asking. He sprang at her, knife a blur, and she whipped out of the way. He slashed at her, and she dodged again, watching as he lumbered towards the door, tearing the curtain from its hooks. He lunged at her, feathers spewing up in a fountain as he hacked a cushion open, splinters flying as he smashed the counter over with his flailing boot, cloth ripping as he slashed one of the hangings in half. Mason gave a bellow like a hurt bull and charged at her once more. Javra caught his wrist as the knife blade flashed towards her, big vein popping from her arm as she held it, straining, the trembling point just a finger's width from her forehead. Got you now! Mason sprayed spit through his clenched teeth as he caught Javra by her thick neck, forced her back a step. She snatched the big prayer bell from the shelf and smashed him over the head with it. The almighty clang so loud it rattled the teeth in Shev's head. Javra hit him again, twisting free of his clutching hand, and he gave a groan and dropped to his knees, blood pouring down his face. Javra raised her arm high and smashed him onto his back, bell breaking from handle and clattering away into the corner, the ringing echoes gradually fading. Javra looked up at Crandall, her face all spotted with Mason's blood. Did you hear that? She raised her red brows. Time for you to pray. Oh, hell, croaked Crandall. He let the hatchet clatter to the boards and held his open palms up high. Now, look here, he stammered out. I'm Horold, son. Horold the finger. Javra shrugged as she stepped over Mason's body. I am new in town. One name strikes me no harder than another. My father runs things here. He gives the orders. Javra grinned as she stepped over Big Coat's corpse. He does not give me orders. He'll pay you. 
more money than you can count. Javra poked Pockface's fallen knife aside with the toe of her boot. I do not want it. I have simple tastes. Crandall's voice grew shriller as he shrank away from her. If you hurt me, he'll catch up to you. Javra shrugged again as she took another step. We can hope so. It would be his last mistake. Just, please, Crandall cringed. Please, I'm begging you. It really is not me you have to beg, said Javra, nodding over his shoulder. Chev whistled, and Crandall turned around, surprised. He looked even more surprised when she buried the blade of Mason's hatchet in his forehead with a sharp crack. Well, he said, tongue hanging out. Then he toppled backwards, his limp hand catching the stand and knocking it and the tin bowl flying, showering hot coals across the wall. Shit, said Chev, as flames shot up the flimsy hangings. She grabbed the water jug, but its meager contents made scarcely any difference. Fire had already spread to the next curtain, shreds of burning ash fluttering down. Best vacate the premises, said Javra, and she took Chev under the arm with a grip that was not to be resisted and marched her smartly out through the door, leaving four dead men scattered about the burning room. The one who'd had his hands in his pockets was leaning against the wall in the street, clutching at his own knife stuck in his thigh. Wait, he said, as Javra caught him by the collar, and with a flick of her wrist sent him reeling across the street to crash headfirst into a wall. Severard was running up, staring at the building, flames already licking around the doorframe. Javra caught him and guided him away. Nothing to be done. Bad choice of decor in a place with naked flames. As if to underscore the point, the window shattered, fire gouting into the street, and Severard ducked with his hands over his head. What the hell happened? he moaned. Went bad, whispered Chev, clutching at her side. Went bad. You call that bad? Javra scraped the dirty red hair out of her battered face and grinned at the ruin of Chev's hopes as though it looked a good enough day's work to her. I say it could have been far worse. How? snapped Chev. How could it be fucking worse? We might both be dead. She gave a sharp little laugh. Come out alive. It is a victory. This is what happens, said Severard, his eyes shining with reflected fire as the building burned brighter. This is what happens when you do a kindness. Ah, stop crying, boy. Kindness brings kindness in the long run. The goddess holds our just rewards in trust. I am Jevra, by the way. And she clapped him on the shoulder and near knocked him over. Do you have an older brother by any chance? Fighting always gets me in the mood. What? Brothers? Maybe? Chev clutched at her head. Felt like it was going to burst. I killed Crandall, she whispered. I bloody killed him. They'll come after me now. They'll never stop coming. <laughs> Jabra put one great, muscled, bruised arm around Chev's shoulders, strangely reassuring and smothering at once. You should see the bastards coming after me. Now, about stealing back this sword of mine. The Fool Jobs East of the Crinna, Autumn 574 Craw chewed the hard skin around his nails, just like he always did. They hurt, just like they always did. He thought to himself that he really had to stop doing that, just like he always did. Why is it? he muttered under his breath, and with some bitterness, too. 
I always get stuck with the fool jobs. The village squatted in the fork of the river, a clutch of damp thatch roofs, scratty as an idiot's hair, a man-high fence of rough-cut logs ringing it. Round wattle huts and three long halls dumped in the muck, ends of the curving wooden uprights on the biggest badly carved, like dragon's heads or wolves' heads or something that was meant to make men scared but only made craw nostalgic for decent carpentry. Smoke limped up from chimneys in muddy smears. Half-bare trees still shook browning leaves. In the distance, the reedy sunlight glimmered on the rotten fens like a thousand mirrors stretching off to the horizon, but without the romance. Wonderful stopped scratching at the long scar through her shaved stubble hair long enough to make a contribution. Looks to me, she said, like a confirmed shithole. We're way out east of the crinner, no? Craw worked a speck of skin between his teeth and tongue and spat it out, wincing at the pink mark left by his nail, way more painful than it had any right to be. Nothing but hundreds of miles of shit all in every direction. You sure this is the place, Robin? I'm sure. She was most specifical. Craw frowned. He weren't sure if he'd taken such a pronounced dislike to Robin because he was the one that brought the jobs, and the jobs were usually cracked, or if he'd taken such a pronounced dislike to Robin because the man was a weasel-faced arsehole. Bit of both, maybe. The word is specific, halfhead. Got my meaning, no? Village in a fork in the river, she said, south of the fence, three halls, biggest one with uprights carved like fox heads. Ah, Craw snapped his fingers. They're meant to be foxes. Fox clan, these crowd. Are they? So she said. And this thing we've got to bring her, what sort of a thing is it exactly? Well, it's a thing, said Robin. That much we know. Sort of this long, I guess? She didn't say precisely. Unspecifical, was she? asked Wonderful, grinning with every tooth. She said it'd have a kind of light about it. A light? asked Craw. What, like a magic bloody candle? All Robin could do was shrug, which weren't a scrap of use to no one. I don't know. She said you'd know it when you saw it. Oh, nice. Craw hadn't thought his mood could drop much lower. Now he knew better. That's real nice. So you want me to bet my life and the lives of my crew on knowing it when I see it? He shoved himself back off the rocks on his belly, out of sight of the village, clambered up and brushed the dirt from his coat, muttering darkly to himself, since it was a new one and he'd been taking some trouble to keep it clean. Should have known that'd be a waste of effort what with the shitty jobs he always ended up into his neck. He started back down the slope, shaking his head, striding through the trees towards the others. A good, confident stride, a leader's stride. It was important, Craw reckoned, for a chief to walk like he knew where he was going, especially when he didn't. Robin hurried after him, whiny voice picking at his back. She didn't precisely say... About the thing, you know. I mean, she don't always. She just looks at you with those eyes. He gave a shudder and says, Fetch me this thing and where from. And what with the paint and that voice of hers and that sweat of bloody fear you get when she looks at you. Another shudder, hard enough to rattle his rotten teeth. I ain't asking no questions, I can tell you that. I'm just looking to run out fast so I don't piss myself on the spot. Run out fast and fetch whatever thing she's after. Well, that's really sweet for you, said Craw. Except insofar as actually getting this thing goes. As far as getting the thing goes, mused Wonderful, splashes of light and shadows swimming across her bony face as she looked up into the branches, the lack of detail presents serious difficulties. All manner of things in a village that size. Which one, though? Which thing is the question?
seemed she was in a thoughtful mood. One might say the voice and the paint and the aura of fear are, in the present case, self-defeating. Oh, no, said Craw. Self-defeating would be if she was the one who ended up way out past the crinner with her throat cut on account of some blurry details on the minor point of the actual job we're bloody here to do. And he gave Robin a hard glare as he strode out of the trees and into the clearing. Scorry was sitting sharpening his knives, eight blades neatly laid out on the patchy grass in front of his crossed legs, from a little pricker, no longer than Craw's thumb, to a hefty carver just this side of a short sword. The ninth he had in his hands, whetstone working at steel, squick, squick, marking the rhythm to his soft high singing. He had a wonder of a singing voice, did Scorry tiptoe. No doubt he would have been a bard in a happier age but there was a steadier living in sneaking up and knifing folk these days. A sad fact, Craw reckoned, but those were the times. Brackidane was sat beside Scorry, lips curled back, nibbling at a stripped rabbit bone, like a sheep nibbling at grass. A huge, very dangerous sheep. The little thing looked like a toothpick in his great tattooed blue lump of a fist, Jolly Yon frowned down at him as if he was a great heap of shit, which Brack might have been upset by if it hadn't been Yon's confirmed habit to look at everything and everyone that way. He properly looked like the least jolly man in all the North at that moment. It was how he'd come by the name, after all. Wirren of Bly was kneeling on his own on the other side of the clearing in front of his great long sword, leaned up against a tree for that purpose. He had his hands clasped in front of his chin, hood drawn down over his head, just the sharp end of his nose showing. Praying, by the look of him. Craw had always been a bit worried by men who prayed to gods, let alone swords. But those were the times, he guessed. In bloody days, swords were worth more than gods. They certainly had him outnumbered. Besides, Wirren was a valley man from way out north and west, across the mountains near the White Sea, where it snowed in summer, and no one with the slightest sense would ever choose to live. Who knew how he thought? Told you it was a real pistine of a village, didn't I? Never was in the midst of stringing his bow. He had that grin he tended to have, like he'd made a joke on everyone else, and no one but him had got it. Craw would have liked to know what it was. He could have done with a laugh. The joke was on all of them, far as he could see. Reckon you had the right of it, said Wonderful, as she strutted past into the clearing. Pess stain. Well, we didn't come to settle down, said Craw. We came to get a thing. Jolly Yon achieved what many might have thought impossible by frowning deeper, black eyes grim as graves, dragging his thick fingers through his thick tangle of a beard. What sort of a thing, exactly? Craw gave Robin another look. You want to dig that one over? The fixer only spread his hands, helpless. I hear we'll know it when we see it. Know it when we see it? What kind of a... Tell it to the trees, Jan. The task is the task. And we're here now, aren't we? said Robin. Craw sucked his teeth at him. Brilliant fucking observation. Like all the best ones, it's true whenever you say it. Yes, we're here. We're here, sang Brackidane in his up-and-down Hillman accent, sucking the last shred of grease from his bone and flicking it into the bushes. East of the crinner, where the moon don't shine, a hundred miles from a clean place to shit, and with wild, crazy bastards dancing all around, think it's a good idea to put bones through their own faces. Which was a little rich, considering he was so covered in tattoos he was more blue than white. There's no style of contempt like the stuff one kind of savage has for another, Craw guessed. Can't deny they've got some funny ideas, east of the Crinner, Robin shrugged. But here's where the thing is, and here's where we are. So why don't we just get the fucking thing and back fucking home? Why don't you get the fucking thing, Robin? growled Jolly Yon. 
Because it's my fucking job to fucking tell you to get the fucking thing is why, you fucking cumber. There was a long, ugly pause, uglier than the child of a man and a sheep, as the hillmen have it. Then Yon talked in his quiet voice, the one that still gave Craw prickles up his arms, even after all these years. I hope I'm wrong. By the dead, I hope I'm wrong. But I'm getting this feeling. He shifted forward, and it was awfully clear all of a sudden just how many axes he was carrying. Like I'm being disrespected. No, 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 not at all. I, I didn't mean... Respect, Robin. That shit costs nothing. But it can spare a man from trying to hold his brains in all the way back home. Am I clear enough? Course you are, Jan. Course you are. I'm over the line. I'm all over it on both sides of it, and I'm sorry. Didn't mean no disrespect. A lot of pressure is all. A lot of pressure for everyone. It's my neck on the block, just like yours. Not down there, maybe, but back home, you can be sure of that, if she don't get her way. Robin shuddered again, worse than ever. A touch of respect don't seem too much to ask. Enough. Craw waved the pair of them down. We're all sinking on the same leaky bloody skiff. There's no help arguing about it. We need every man to a bucket, and every woman too. I'm always helpful, said Wonderful, all innocence. If only. Craw squatted, pulling out a blade and starting to scratch a map of the village in the dirt. The way three trees used to do a long, long time ago. We might not know exactly what this thing is, but we know where it is at least. Knife scraped through earth as the others gathered, kneeling, sitting, squatting, looking on. A big hall in the middle, with uprights on it carved like foxes' heads. They're dragons, you ask me, but, you know, that's another story. There's a fence around the outside, two gates, north and south. Houses and huts over here. A pig pen there, I think. That's a forge, maybe. How many do we reckon might be down there? asked John. Wonderful rubbed at the scar on her scalp, face twisted as she glanced up towards the pale sky. Could be fifty, sixty fighting men, a few elders, a few dozen women and children, too. Some of those might hold a blade. Women fighting? Never grinned. A disgrace is that. Wonderful bared her teeth back at him. Get those bitches to the cook fire, eh? Ow, the cook fire! Brack stared up into the cloudy sky like it was packed with happy memories. Sixty warriors, and we're but seven plus the baggage. Jolly Yon curled his tongue and blew spit over Robin's boots in a neat arc. Shit on that! We need more men! Wouldn't be enough food, then. Brackidane laid a sad hand on his belly. It's hardly enough as it... Craw cut him off. Maybe we should stick to plans using the number we've got, eh? Plain as plain. Sixties, way too many to fight fair. Not that anyone had joined his crew for a fair fight, of course. We need to draw some off. Never winced. Any point asking why you're looking at me? Because ugly men ain't nothing worse than handsome men, pretty boy. It's a fact I can't deny. Never sighed, flicking his long hair back. I'm cursed with a fine face. Your curse, my blessing. Craw jabbed at the north end of his dirt plan, where a wooden bridge crossed a stream. You'll take your unmatched beauty in towards the bridge. They'll have guards posted, no doubt. Mount a diversion. Shoot one of them, you mean? Shoot near em, maybe. Let's not kill anyone we don't have to, eh? They might be nice enough folks under different circumstances. Never sent up a dubious eyebrow. You reckon? Craw didn't, particularly, but he'd no desire to weight his conscience down any further. It didn't float too well as it was. Just lead him a little dance, that's all. Wonderful clapped a hand to her chest. Oh, I'm so sorry I'll miss it. No one dances prettier than our never when the music gets going. 
never grinned at her. Don't worry, sweetness. I'll dance for you later. Promises, promises. Yes, yes. Craw shut the pair of them up with another wave. You can make us all laugh when this fool job's done with, if we're still breathing. Maybe we'll make you laugh too, eh, Wirren? said Wonderful. The valley man sat cross-legged, soared across his knees, and shrugged. Maybe. We're a tight little group, us lot. We like things friendly. Wirren's eyes slid across to Jolly Yon's black frown and back. I see that. We like brothers, said Brack, grinning all over his tattooed face. We share the risks, we share the food, we share the rewards, and from time to time, we even share a laugh. Never got on too well with my brothers, said Wirren. Wonderful snorted. Well, aren't you blessed, boy? You've been given a second chance at a loving family. You last long enough, you'll learn how it works. The shadow of Wirren's hood crept up and down his face as he slowly nodded. Every day should be a new lesson. Good advice, said Craw. Ears open, then, one and all. Soon as never's drawn a few off, we creep in at the south gate. And he put a cross in the dirt to show where it was. Two groups, one each side of the main hall there, where the thing is. Where the thing's meant to be, leastways. Me, Yon, and Wirren on the left. Yon spat again. Wirren gave the slightest nod. Wonderful. Take Brack and Scorry down the right. Right you are, Chief, said Wonderful. Right for us, sang Brack. So, 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 said Scorry, which Craw took for a yes. He stabbed at each of them with one chewed to bug a fingernail. And all on your best behavior, you hear? Quiet as a spring breeze. No tripping over the pots this time, eh, Brack? I'll mind my boots, Chief. Good enough. We got a backup plan, asked Wonderful, in case the impossible happens and things don't work out quite according to the scheme. The usual. Grab the thing if we can, then run like fuck. You. And Craw gave Robin a look. His eyes went wide as two cookpots. What, me? Stay here. I mind the gear. Robin gave a long sigh of relief, and Craw felt his lip curl. He didn't blame the man for being a hell of a coward. Most men were. Craw was one himself. But he blamed him for letting it show. Don't get too comfortable, though, eh? If the rest of us come to grief, these fox fuckers will track you down before our blood's dry, and more than likely cut your fruits off. Robin's sigh rattled to a quick stop. Cut your head off, whispered Never, eyes all scary wide. Pull your guts out and cook em, growled Jolly on. Skin your face off and wear it as a mask, rumbled Brack. Use your cock for a spoon said Wonderful. They all thought about that for a moment. Right then, said Craw. Nice and careful, and let's get in that hall without no one noticing, and find us that thing. Above all, and he swept the lot of them with his sternest look, a half-circle of dirt-smeared, scar-pocked, bright-eyed, beard-fuzzed faces, his crew, his family. Nobody die, eh? Weapons. Quick, sharp, and with no grumbling now the work was at their feet, Craw's crew got ready for action, each one smooth and practised with their gear as a weaver with his loom, weapons neat as their clothes were ragged, bright and clean as their faces were dirty. Belts, straps, and bootlaces hissed tight, metal scraped, rattled, and rang, and all the while Scorry's song floated out soft and high. Craw's hands moved by themselves through the old routines, mind wandering across the years to other times he'd done it, other places, other faces around him, a lot of them gone back to the mud long ago, a few he'd buried with his own hands. He hoped none of these folk died today and became nothing but dirt and worn-out memories. He checked his shield, grip bound in leather, all tight and sturdy, straps firm. He checked his knife, 
his backup knife, and his backup backup knife, all tight in their sheaths. You can never have too many knives, someone once told him, and it was solid advice, provided you were careful how you stowed them and didn't fall over and get your own blade in your fruits. Everyone had their work to be about, except Wirren. He just bowed his head as he lifted his sword gently from the tree trunk, holding it under the crosspiece by its stained leather scabbard, sheathed blade longer than one of his own long legs. Then he pushed his hood back, scrubbed his dirty fingernails through his flattened hair, and stood watching the others, head on one side. That the only blade you carry? asked Craw as he stowed his own sword at his hip, hoping to draw the tall man in, start to build some trust with him. Tight crew like this was, a bit of trust might save your life, might save everyone's. Wirren's eyes swiveled to him. This is the father of swords, and men have a hundred names for it. Dawn Razor, Grave Maker, Bloody Harvest, Highest and Lowest, Skag and Gaiok in the Valley Tongue, which means the splitting of the world, the battle that was fought at the start of time and will be fought again at its end. For a moment he had Craw wondering if he'd list the whole bloody hundred, but thankfully he stopped there, frowning at the hilt, wound with dull grey wire. This is my reward and my punishment both. This is the only blade I need. Bit long for eating with, no? asked Wonderful, strutting up from the other side. Wirren bared his teeth at her. That's what these are for. Don't you ever sharpen it? asked Craw. It sharpens me. Right. Right you are. He hoped Wirren was as good with that great big blade as he was supposed to be, because he surely brought nothing to the table as a conversationalist. Besides, to sharpen it, you'd have to draw it, said Wonderful, winking at Craw with the eye Wirren couldn't see. True. Wirren's eyes slid up to her face. And once the father of swords is drawn, he cannot be sheathed without being blooded, she finished for him. Didn't take skill with the runes to see that coming. Wirren must have said the same words a dozen times since they left Carlion, enough for everyone to get somewhat tired of it. Blooded, echoed Wirren, voice full of portent. Wonderful gave Craw a look. You ever think, Wirren of Bly, you might take yourself a touch too serious? He tipped his head back and stared up into the sky. I'll laugh when I hear something funny. Craw felt Yon's hand on his shoulder. A word, Chief. Of course, with a grin that took some effort. He guided Craw away from the others a few steps and spoke soft the same words he always did before a fight. If I die down there... No one's dying today, snapped Craw, the same words he always used in reply. So you said last time, before we buried Jutland. That drove Craw's mood another rung down the ladder into the bog. No one's fault. We do a dangerous style of work, and all know it. Chances are good I'll live through, but all I'm saying is, if I don't... I'll stop by your children and take them your share and tell them what you were. That's right. And? And I won't dress it up any. Right then. Jolly Yon didn't smile, of course. Craw had known him for years and hadn't seen him smile more than a dozen times, and even then when it was least expected. But he nodded, satisfied. Right. No men I'd rather give the task to. Craw nodded back. Good. Great. No task he wanted less. As Yon walked off, he muttered to himself, Always the fool jobs. It went pretty much just like Craw planned. He wouldn't have called it the first time ever, but it was a pleasant surprise, that was sure. The six of them lay still and silent on the rise, followed the little movements of leaf and branch that marked never creeping towards that crap-ass of a village. It looked no better the closer you got to it. 
things really did in Craw's experience. He chewed at his nails some more, saw Never kneel in the bushes across the stream from the north gate, knocking an arrow and drawing the string. It was hard to tell from this range, but it looked like he still had that knowing little grin, even now. He loosed his shaft, and Craw thought it clicked into one of the logs that made the fence. Faint shouting drifted on the wind. A couple of arrows wobbled back the other way, vanished into the trees, as Never turned and scuttled off, lost in the brush. Craw heard some kind of a drum beating, more shouting, then men started to hurry out across that bridge, weapons of rough iron clutched in their hands, some dragging furs or boots on still. Perhaps three dozen, all told. A neat piece of work, provided never got away, of course. Yon shook his head as he watched a good chunk of the fox clan shambling over their bridge and into the trees. Amazing, isn't it? I never quite get used to just how fucking stupid people are. Always a mistake to overestimate the bastards, whispered Craw. Good thing we're the cleverest crew in the circle of the world, eh? So, could we have no fuck-ups today, if you please? I won't if you won't, chief muttered Wonderful. <sighs> if only he could make that promise. Craw tapped Scorry on his shoulder and pointed down into the village. The little man winked back, then slid over the rise on his belly and down through the undergrowth, nimble as a tadpole through a pond. Craw worked his dry tongue around his dry mouth, always ran out of spit at a time like this, and however often he did it, it never got any better. He glanced out the corner of his eye at the others, none of them showing much sign of a weak nerve. He wondered if they were bubbling up with worry on the inside, just like he was, and putting a stern face on the wreckage, just like he was. Or if it was only him scared. But in the end, it didn't make much difference. The best you could do with fear was act like you had none. He held his fist up, pleased to see his hand didn't shake, then pointed after Scorry, and they all set off. Down towards the south gate, if you could use the phrase about a gap in a rotten fence under a kind of arch made from crooked branches, skull of some animal unlucky enough to have a fearsome pair of horns mounted in the middle of it. Made Craw wonder if they had a straight piece of wood within a hundred bloody miles. The one guard left stood under that skull, leaning on his spear, staring at nothing tangle-haired and fur-clad. He picked his nose and held one finger up to look at the results. He flicked it away. He stretched and reached around to scratch his ass. Scorry's knife thudded into the side of his neck and chopped his throat out, quick and simple as a fisher gutting a salmon. Craw winced, just for a moment, but he knew there'd be no dodging it. They'd be lucky if that was the only man lost his life so they could get this full job done. Scorry held him a moment while blood showered from his slit neck, caught him as he fell, guided his twitching body soundless to the side of the gate, out of sight of any curious eyes inside. No more noise than the breeze in the brush, Craw and the rest hurried up the bank, bent double, weapons in hand. Scorry was waiting, knife already wiped, peering around the side of the gatepost with one palm up behind him to say, wait. Craw frowned down at the dead man's bloody face, mouth a bit open, as though he was about to ask a question. A potter makes pots, a baker makes bread, and this is what Craw made. All he'd made his whole life, pretty much. It was hard to feel much pride at the sight, however neatly the work had been done. It was still a man murdered just for guarding his own village, because they were men, these with hopes and sorrows and all the rest, even if they lived out here past the crinner and didn't wash too often. But what could one man do? Craw took a long breath in and let it out slow. Just get the task done without any of his own people killed. In hard times, soft thoughts can kill you quicker than the plague. He looked at Wonderful and jerked his head into the village, and she slid around the gatepost and in, slipping across to the right-hand track, shaved head swivelling carefully left and right. Scorry followed at her heels, and Brack crept after, silent, 
for all his great bulk. Craw took a long breath, then crept across to the left-hand track, wincing as he tried to find the hardest, quietest bits of the rutted muck to plant his feet on. He heard the hissing of Yon's careful breath behind him. Knew Wirren was there too, though he moved quiet as a cat. Craw could hear something clicking. A spinning wheel, maybe? He heard someone laugh, not sure if he was imagining it. His head was jerked this way and that by every trace of a sound, like he had a hook through his nose. The whole thing seemed horribly bright and obvious right then. Maybe they should have waited for darkness. But Craw had never liked working at night. Not since that fucking disaster at Gurndrift, where Pale as Snow's boys ended up fighting Little Bones on an accident, and more than fifty men dead without an enemy within ten miles. Too much to go wrong at night. But then Craw had seen plenty of men die in the day, too. He slid along beside a wattle wall, and he had that sweat of fear on him, that prickling sweat that comes with death right at your shoulder. Everything was picked out sharper than sharp, every stick in the wattle, every pebble in the dirt. The way the leather binding the grip of his sword dug at his palm when he shifted his fingers. The way each in-breath gave the tiniest whistle when it got three-quarters into his aching lungs. The way the sole of his foot stuck to the inside of his boot through the hole in his sock with every careful step, stuck to it and peeled away. He needed to get him some new socks is what he needed. Well, first he needed to live out the day, then socks. Maybe even those ones he'd seen in Ufrith last time he was there dyed red. They'd all laughed at that, him and Yon and Wonderful and poor dead Jutlin. Laughed at the madness of it. But afterwards he'd thought to himself, there's luxury that a man could afford to have his socks dyed and cast a wistful glance over his shoulder at that fine cloth. Maybe he'd go back after this fool job was done with and get himself a pair of red socks. Maybe he'd get himself two pairs, wear them on the outside of his boots, just to show folk what a big man he was. Maybe they'd take to calling him Kerndon Red Socks. He felt a smile in spite of himself. Red Socks. That was the first step on the road to ruin if ever he'd the door to a hovel on their left wobbled open, and three men walked out of it, all laughing. The one at the front turned his shaggy head, big smile still plastered across his face, yellow teeth sticking out of it. He looked straight at Craw and Yon and Wirren, stuck frozen against the side of a longhouse with their mouths open, like three children caught nicking biscuits. Everyone stared at each other. Craw felt time slow to a weird crawl, that way it did before blood spilled. Enough time to take in silly things, to wonder whether it was a chicken bone in one of their ears, to count the nails through one of their clubs, eight and a half. Enough time to think it was funny he wasn't thinking something more useful. It was like he stood outside himself, wondering what he'd do, but feeling it probably weren't up to him. And the oddest thing of all, was that it had happened so often to him now, that feeling, he could recognize it when it came, that frozen, baffled moment before the world comes apart. Shit, here I am again. He felt the cold wind kiss the side of his face as Wirren swung his sword in a great reaping circle. The man at the front didn't even have time to duck. The flat of the sheathed blade hit him on the side of the head, whipped him off his feet, turned him head over heels in the air, and sent him crashing into the wall of the shack beside them, upside down. Craw's hand lifted his sword without being told. Wirren darted forward, arm lancing out, smashing the pommel of his sword into the second man's mouth, sending teeth and bits of teeth flying. While he was toppling back like a felled tree, arms spread wide, the third tried to raise a club. Craw hacked him in the side, steel biting through fur and flesh with a wet thud, spots of blood showering out of him. The man opened his mouth and gave a great high shriek, tottering forward, bent over, eyes bulging. Craw split his skull wide open, sword grip jolting in his hand, the scream choked off in a surprised yip. 
the body sprawled, blood pouring from broken head and all over Craw's boots. Looked like he'd come out of this with red socks after all. So much for no more dead, and so much for quiet as a spring breeze, too. Fuck, said Craw. By then, time was moving way too fast for comfort. The world jerked and wobbled, full of flying dirt as he ran. Screams rang and metal clashed, his own breath and his own heart roaring and surging in his ears. He snatched a glance over his shoulder, saw Yon barge a mace away with his shield and roar as he hacked a man down. As Craw turned back, an arrow came from the dead new ware and clicked into the mud wall just in front of him, almost made him fall over backwards with shock. Wirren went into his arse and knocked him sprawling, gave him a mouthful of mud. When he struggled up, a man was charging right at him, a flash of screaming face and wild hair smeared across his sight. Craw was twisting around behind his shield when Scorry slid out from nowhere and knifed the running bastard in the side, made him shriek and stumble. Craw took the side of his head off, blade pinging as it chopped through bone, then thumped into the ground, nearly jerking from his raw fist. Move! he shouted, not sure who at, trying to wrench his blade free of the earth. Jolly Yon rushed past, head of his axe dashed with red, teeth bared in a mad snarl. Craw followed, Wirren behind him, face slack, eyes darting from one hut to another, sword still sheathed in one hand. Around the corner of a hovel, and into a wide stretch of muck scattered with ground-up straw, pigs were honking and squirming in a pen at one side. The hall with the carved uprights stood at the other, steps up to a wide doorway, only darkness inside. A red-haired man pounded across the ground in front of them, a wood axe in his fist. Wonderful calmly put an arrow through his cheek at six strides distant, and he came up short, clapping a hand to his face, still stumbling towards her. She stepped to meet him with a fighting scream, swept her sword out and around, and took his head right off. It spun into the air, showering blood, and dropped in the pig pen. Craw wondered for a moment if the poor bastard still knew what was going on. Then he saw the heavy door of the hall being swung shut, a pale face at the edge. Door! he bellowed and ran for it, pounding across squelching mud and up the wooden steps, making the boards rattle. He shoved one bloody, muddy boot in the gap, just as the door was slammed, and gave a howl, eyes bulging, pain lancing up his leg. My foot! Fuck! There were a dozen fox clan or more crowded around the end of the yard now, growling and grunting louder and uglier than the hogs. They waved jagged swords, axes, rough clubs in their fists, a few with shields, too one at the front with a rusted chain hauberk on, tattered at the hem, straggling hair tangled with rings of rough-forged silver. Back! Wirren stood tall in front of them, holding out his sword at long arm's length, hilt up like it was some magic charm to ward off evil. Back! And you needn't die today! The one in mail spat, then snarled at him in broken northern... Show us your iron, thief! Then I will. Look upon the father of swords and look your last. And Wirren drew it from the sheath. Men might have had a hundred names for it. Dawn Razor, Grave Maker, Blood Harvest, Highest and Lowest, Stag Angayok in the Valley Tongue, which means the splitting of the world, and so on and so on. But Craw had to admit... It was a disappointing length of metal. There was no flame, no golden light, no distant trumpets or mirrored steel, just the gentle scrape as long blade came free of stained leather, the flat grey of damp slate, no shine or ornament about it except for the gleam of something engraved down near the plain dull crosspiece. But Craw had other worries than that Wirren's sword weren't worth all the songs. Door! he squealed at Yon, scrabbling at the edge of it with his left hand, all tangled up with his shield, shoving his sword through the gap and waving it about to no effect. 
My fucking foot! Yon roared as he pounded up the steps and rammed into the door with his shoulder. It gave all of a sudden, tearing from its hinges and crushing some fool underneath. Him and Craw burst stumbling into the room beyond, dim as twilight, hazy with scratchy sweet smoke. A shape came at Craw, and he whipped his shield up on an instinct, felt something thud into it, splinters flying in his face. He reeled off balance, crashed into something else, metal clattering, pottery shattering. Someone loomed up, a ghostly face, a necklace of rattling teeth. Craw lashed at him with his sword, and again, and again, and he went down, white-painted face spattered with red. Craw coughed, retched, coughed, blinking into the reeking gloom, sword ready to swing. He heard Yon roaring, heard the thud of an axe in flesh and someone squeal. The smoke was clearing now, enough for Craw to get some sense of the hall. Coals glowed in a fire pit, lighting a spider's web of carved rafters in sooty red and orange, casting shifting shadows on each other, tricking his eyes. The place was hot as hell, and smelled like hell besides. Old hangings around the walls, tattered canvas daubed with painted marks. A block of black stone at the far end, a rough statue standing over it, and at its feet, the glint of gold. A cup, Craw thought. A goblet. He took a step towards it, trying to waft the murk away from his face with his shield. Yon! he shouted. Craw! Where you at? Some strange kind of song was coming from somewhere, words Craw didn't know but didn't like the sound of. Not one bit. Yon! And a figure sprang up suddenly from behind that block of stone. Craw's eyes went wide, and he almost fell in the fire pit as he stumbled back. He wore a tattered red robe, long sinewy arms sticking from it, spread wide, smeared with paint and beaded up with sweat, the skull of some animal drawn down over his face, black horns curling from it, so he looked in the shifting light like a devil bursting straight up from hell. Craw knew it was a mask, but looming up like that out of the smoke, strange song echoing from that skull, he felt suddenly rooted to the spot with fear. So much he couldn't even lift his sword. Just stood there, trembling. Every muscle turned to water. He'd never been a hero, that was true, but he'd never felt fear like this. Not even at Innerwood, when he'd seen the bloody nine coming for him snarling madman's face all dashed with other men's blood. He stood helpless. <laughs> the priest came forward, lifting one long arm. He had a thing gripped in painted fingers, a twisted piece of wood, the faintest pale glow about it. The thing, the thing they'd come for. Light flared from it brighter and brighter, so bright it burned its twisted shape fizzing into Craw's eyes, the sound of the song filling his ears until he couldn't hear anything else, couldn't think anything else, couldn't see nothing but that thing, searing bright as the sun, stealing his breath, crushing his will, stopping his breath, cutting his crack. Jolly Yon's axe split the animal's skull in half and chopped into the face underneath it. Blood sprayed, hissed in the coals of the fire pit. Craw felt spots on his face, blinked, and shook his head, loosed all of a sudden from the freezing grip of fear. The priest lurched sideways, song turned to a guttering gurgle, mask split in half, and blood squirting from under it. Craw snarled as he swung his sword, chopped into the sorcerer's chest, and knocked him over on his back. The thing bounced from his hand and spun away across the rough plank floor. The blinding light faded to the faintest glimmer. Fucking sorcerers, snarled Yon, curling his tongue and blowing spit onto the corpse. Why do they bother? How long does it take to learn all that jabber? And it never does you half the good a decent knife, he frowned. Uh-oh. The priest had fallen in the fire pit, scattering glowing coals across the floor. A couple had skittered as far as the ragged hem of one of the hangings. 
Shit. Craw took a step on shaky legs to kick it away. Before he got there, flames sputtered around the old cloth. Shit. He tried to stamp it out, but his head was still a touch spinny, and he only got embers scattered against his trouser leg, had to hop around, slapping them off. The flames spread, licking up faster than the plague. Too much flame to put out, spurting higher than a man. Shit! Craw stumbled back, feeling the heat on his face, red shadows dancing among the rafters. Get the thing and let's go! Yon was already fumbling with the straps on his leather pack. Right ya, chief! Right ya! Back up, plan! Craw left him and hurried to the doorway, not sure who'd be alive still on the other side. He burst out into the day, light stabbing at his eyes after the gloom. Wonderful was standing there, mouth hanging wide open. She'd an arrow knocked to her half-drawn bow, but it was pointed at the ground, hands slack. Craw couldn't remember the last time he'd seen her surprised. What is it? he snapped, getting his sword tangled up on the doorframe, then snarling as he wrenched it free. You hurt? He squinted into the sun, shading his eyes with his shield. What's the... And he stopped on the steps and stared. By the dead. Wirren had hardly moved. The father of swords still gripped in his fist, long, dull blade pointing to the ground. Only now he was spotted and spattered head to toe in blood, and the twisted and hacked, split and ruined corpses of the dozen fox clan who'd faced him were scattered around his boots in a wide half circle, a few bits that used to be attached to them scattered wider still. I killed the howl lot. Brack's face was all crinkled up with confusion. Just like that? I never even lifted my hammer. Damnedest thing, muttered Wonderful. Damnedest thing. She wrinkled her nose. Can I smell smoke? Yon burst from the hall, stumbled into Craw's back, and nearly sent the pair of them tumbling down the steps. Did you get the thing? snapped Craw. I think I... Yon blinked at Wirren, standing tall in his circle of slaughter. By the dead, though. Wirren started to back towards them, twisted himself sideways as an arrow looped over and stuck wobbling into the side of the hall. He waved his free hand. Maybe we'd better... Run! roared Craw. Perhaps a good leader should wait until everyone else gets clear first man to arrive in a fight and the last to leave. That was how three trees used to do it. But Craw weren't three trees, it hardly needed to be said, and he was off like a rabbit with its tail on fire. Leading by example, he'd have called it. He heard bowstrings behind him, an arrow zipped past, just wide of his flailing arm, stuck wobbling into one of the hovels, then another. His squashed foot was aching like fury, but he limped on, waving his shield arm, pounding towards the jerking, wobbling archway with the animal skull above it. Go! Go! Wonderful tore past, feet flying, flicking mud in Craw's face. He saw Scorry flip between two huts up ahead, then swift as a lizard, around one of the gateposts and out of the village. He hurled himself after, under the arch of branches jumped down the bank, caught his hurt foot, body jolting, teeth snapping together and catching his tongue. He took one more wobbling step, then went flying, crashed into the boggy bracken, rolled over his shield with just enough thought left to keep his sword from cutting his own nose off. He struggled to his feet, laboured on up the slope, legs burning, lungs burning, through the trees, trousers soaked to the knee with marsh water. He could hear Brack lumbering along at his shoulder, grunting with the effort, and behind him, Yon's growl. Bloody shit! Bloody running! Bloody shit! He tore through the brush and wobbled into the clearing where they'd made their plans. Plans that hadn't flown too smoothly as it went. Robin was standing by the gear, wonderful near him, with her hands on her hips. Never was kneeling on the far side of the clearing, arrow knocked to his bow. He grinned as he saw Craw. You made it then, chief? 
Shit! Craw stood bent over, head spinning, dragging in air. <laughs> Shit! He straightened, staring at the sky, face on fire, not able to think of another word, and without the breath to say one if he could have. Brack looked even more shot than Craw, if it was possible, crouched over, hands on knees and knees wobbling, big chest heaving, big face red as a slapped ass around his tattoos. Yon tottered up and leaned against a tree, cheeks puffed out, skin shining with sweat. Wonderful was hardly out of breath. By the dead, the state of you fat old men. She slapped Never on the arm. That was some nice work down there at the village. Thought they'd catch you and skin you sure. You hoped, you mean, said Never. But you should have known better. I'm the best damn runner away in the north. That is a fact. Where's Scorry? gasped Craw, enough breath in him now to worry. Never jerked his thumb. Circled around to check no one's coming for us. Wirren ambled back into the clearing, hood drawn up again, and the father of swords sheathed across his shoulders like a milkmaid's yoke, one hand on the grip, the other dangling over the blade. I take it they're not following, asked Wonderful, one eyebrow raised. Wirren shook his head. Nope. Can't say I blame the poor bastards. I take back what I said about you taking yourself too serious. You're one serious fucker with that sword. You get the thing? asked Robin, face all pale with worry. That's right, Robin. We saved your skin. Craw wiped his mouth, blood on the back of his hand from his bitten tongue. They'd done it, and his sense of humour was starting to leak back in. Ha! <laughs> Did you imagine if we'd left the bastard thing behind? Never fear, said Yon, flipping open his pack. Jolly Yon Cumber! Once more the fucking hero, and he delved his hand inside and pulled it out. Craw blinked. Then he frowned. Then he stared. Gold glinted in the fading light, and he felt his heart sink lower than it had all day. That ain't fucking it, Yon. It's not. That's a cup. It was the thing we wanted. He stuck his sword point down in the ground and waved one hand about. The bloody thing with a kind of bloody light about it! Yon stared back at him. No one told me it had a bloody light! There was silence for a moment then while they all thought about it. No sound but the wind rustling the old leaves, making the black branches creak. Then Wirren tipped his head back and roared with laughter. A couple of crows took off startled from a branch, it was that loud, flapping up sluggish into the grey sky. Why the hell are you laughing? snapped Wonderful. Inside his hood, Wirren's twisted face was glistening with happy tears. I told you I'd laugh when I heard something funny and he was off again, spine arching like a full-drawn bow, whole body shaking. You'll have to go back, said Robin. Back, muttered Wonderful, her dirt-streaked face a picture of disbelief. Back, you mad fucker. You know, the hall caught fire, don't you? snapped Brack, one big trembling arm pointed down towards the thickening column of smoke wafting up from the village. It what? asked Robin, as Wirren blasted a fresh shriek at the sky, hacking, gurgling, only just keeping on his feet. Oh, I burned down, more than likely with a damn thing in it. Well, I don't know, you just have to pick through the ashes. How about... We pick through your fucking ashes, snarled Yon, throwing the cup down on the ground. Craw gave a long sigh, rubbed at his eyes, then winced down towards that shithole of a village. Behind him, Wirren's laughter soared throaty at the dusk. Always, he muttered under his breath, why do I 
always get stuck with the full jobs. Skipping Town, the near country, summer five seventy five. Maybe we should skip town," said Javra. "Oh no, no, no! Not this time!" Shev snapped back at her. "You can't just career through life, leaving the wreckage of your mistakes behind you." A silence as they hurried on through the shadows. Shev having to half jog to keep up as Javra ploughed ahead with immense strides, brow furrowed in thought. "What is it that we have been doing this past year, then?" "Well, we've." Shev thought about it. That's just my point. We can't keep doing it. I see. So we give Tabna his jewel. We collect the promised money. We pay our gambling debts. Your gambling debts. Then what? We put down roots here. Javra raised one red brow at the crumbling buildings, the rubbish-strewn street, a fish-stinking beggar hacking out diseased coughs in a doorway. Well, no, we move on. And what we left behind us tonight? Javra jerked her head the way they'd come. Would you call that wreckage? I would call that. Shev wondered how much this particular truth would stretch before it tore to bits. A series of mishaps. It looked like wreckage to me. Once the front of the mansion collapsed, you would have to call that wreckage, no? Shev glanced quickly over her shoulder yet again to make sure no one was following. I suppose an uncharitable speaker could describe it so. Then explain to me, if you would, Shevedia, how your way differs from mine, except that we leave town with less money. We leave with less enemies as well. I tire of leaving a new score in every shit hole we pass through, like a rabbit leaves droppings. Sooner or later, I might need a good shithole to pass through again. All the damn enemies! I wake up sweating, you know, in the night. That is all that spicy food," said Javra. "I do not know how often I have warned you about your diet. And enemies are a good thing. Enemies show you make an impression. Oh, you make an impression, all right. That I would never deny. You made a hell of an impression on those boys tonight. Javra grinned a mass of white teeth as she punched one scabbed fist into one calloused palm with a smack like a door slamming. I certainly did, but I'm a thief, Javra. Not whatever you are. I'm supposed to keep a low profile. Ah, Javra raised that same red brow again as she glanced sideways. Hence all the black. And it does look rather well on me. I think you'd have to agree. You certainly are a shadowy and seductive corrupter of innocent maidenhood. Javra playfully jogged Shev in the ribs with an elbow and nearly sent her careering into the nearest wall. Then caught her by the hand and dragged her into a crushing embrace. Her cheek squashed into Javra's armpit. We shall do it your way then, Shevedia, my friend. Straight. And true and morally upright, just as a thief should be. We shall pay your debts, then get drunk and find some men. Shev was still struggling to get a breath in after that elbow. What is it exactly that you think I'd do with them? Javra grinned. The men would be for me. I am a woman of thond and have grand appetites. You can keep watch. My towering thanks for the immensity of that honor. Said Shev, slipping from under the weight of Javra's mightily muscled arm, "It is the least I could do. You have been a fine sidekick so far. I thought this was an equal partnership. All the best sidekicks think that," said Javra, striding towards the front door of the weeping slaver, its sign hanging precariously from a rusting pole by one loop. Shev caught Javra's arm and, by hanging off it with all her weight and digging her heels into the mud, managed to stop her taking the next step. 
I have a feeling Tumner will be expecting us. That was the arrangement. Javra looked down at her, puzzled. Given that he was less than entirely forthcoming about the job, it may be that he'll try to double-cross us. Javra frowned. You think he might break the agreement? He didn't mention the traps, did he? Asked Chev, still heaving at Javra's arm. Or the long drop, or the wall, or the dogs, and he said two guards, not twelve. Muscles worked as Javra clenched her jaw. He said nothing about that sorcerer either. Exactly, Chev managed to gasp, every sinew trembling with effort. Breath of the mother, you're right. Chev breathed a sigh of relief and slowly stood, patting Javra's arm as she released it. I'll sneak in around the back and make sure that... Javra gave her a huge smile. The lioness of Hoskop never uses the back door and she sprang up the steps, raised one boot, kicked the front door splintering from its hinges, and strode inside, the filthy tails of her once white coat flapping after. Chevedia gave brief but serious consideration to sprinting off down the street, then sighed and crept up the steps after her. The weeping slaver wasn't the most auspicious of settings, though Chev had to admit she'd been in worse. Indeed, she'd spent most of the last few years in worse. Size it had, big as a barn, with a balcony at first floor level, ill-lit by a vast circular chandelier with smoking candles in stained glass cups. The floor was covered in dirty straw and a mismatched jumble of chairs and tables, a warped counter down one side with the cheapest spirits of a dozen dozen cultures stacked on shelves behind. The place smelled of smoke and sweat, of spilled drinks and sprayed vomit, of desperation and wasted chances, and was very much as it had been three nights ago when they took the job, just before Javra lost half their promised earnings at dice. There was one clear difference, however. That night it had overflowed with scum of every kind. Tonight there appeared to be just the one patron. Tumnor sat at a table in the middle of the room, a fixed grin on his plump face and a sheen of sweat across his forehead. He looked extremely nervous, even for a man perpetrating a double cross on a pair of notorious thieves. He looked in imminent fear of his life. It's a trap! He grunted through his clenched teeth without moving his hands from the tabletop. That we have gathered, fiend, said Javra. No, he grunted, eyes swiveling wildly sideways, then back to them, then sideways again. A trap! That was when Chev noticed his hands were nailed to the table. She followed his glance, past a large brown stain on the floor that looked suspiciously like blood, and into the shadows. She saw a figure there, the glint of eyes, the glimmer of steel, a man poised and ready. Now she took in other telltale gleams in the dark corners of the inn, an axeman wedged behind a drinks cabinet, the nose of a flat bowman peeking into the light on the balcony above, a pair of boots sticking out from the door to the cellar, which she deduced must still be attached to the dead legs of one of Tumnor's hired men. Her heart sank. She hated fighting, and she had the strong feeling she was going to be fighting very soon. It would appear, murmured Chev, leaning towards Javra, that the scum who double-crossed us have been double-crossed by some other scum. Yes! whispered Javra. Her whispers were louder than the usual speaking voice of most people. I find myself conflicted. Who to kill first? Perhaps we could talk our way out? Chev ventured, hopefully. It was important to stay hopeful. Chevedia, we must face the possibility that there will be violence. Your prescience is uncanny. When things get underway, I would be ever so grateful if you could attend to the flat bowman on the balcony just there. Understood, muttered Chev. Most of the rest you can probably leave to me. Too kind. 
and now the unmistakable tread of heavy boots and jingling metal echoed from the back of the inn, and Tumno's face grew even more drawn, beads of sweat rolling down his cheeks. Javra narrowed her eyes. And the villain is revealed. Villains tend to love a bit of theatre, though, don't they? muttered Shev. When she emerged into the shifting candlelight, she was lean and very tall, almost as tall as Javra, perhaps, her black hair chopped short, one sinewy arm bare and covered in blue tattoos, and the other, with plates of battered steel, a gauntlet like a claw at the end, curving nails of sharpened metal clicking as she walked. Her green, green eyes glinted as she smiled towards them. It has been a while, Javra. Javra pushed her lips out. Oh, arse of the goddess, she said. Well met, Waylon, or badly met, at least. You know her, muttered Shev. Javra winced. I must admit she is not an entire stranger to me. She was thirteenth of the fifteen. I am tense now, said Waylon. Since you killed Hanama and Birka. I offered them the same choice I will soon offer you, Javra shrugged. They chose death. Ah, uh, Shev held up one gloved finger. If I may ask, what the hell are we talking about? The woman's emerald green eyes moved across to her. She did not tell you. Tell me what? Javra winced even more. Those friends of mine I mentioned from the temple. The temple in Thond? Yes, they're not so much friends. So neutral towards you, then? Shev ventured, hopefully. It was important to stay hopeful. More enemies, said Javra. I see. The fifteen Knights Templar of the...